How's it going, everyone? My name is JBS, and today I want to share my entire two-year trading journey in detail. So the goal of this video is for me to share my entire experience from literally never having heard trading to achieving a 75% win rate and above a profit factor of two for three straight months trading one share. Let's get some obvious stuff out of the way first. The system of trading is relative strength and relative weakness. If you don't know what that is, stop watching this video, go to Real Trade Trading Wiki, go to One Option, and read those. So I'm assuming that if you are coming to this video, because I'm literally only posting in those places that you actually are aware of this edge, so not talking about anything else. I've broken this video into three parts. The first is my personal journey, how I got into trading, why I decided to quit my job to do trading, going through the emotional roller coaster to learn this piece, and trying to put the pieces of the puzzle together. This is a more personal section, and feel free to skip it if you don't really care. You can go to section two, which is talking about what I learned so far from this journey and not just what I learned, because I think everyone is pretty clear of the what part of it. I think the wiki and the system and one option do a really good job of the what, but how you learn the information, because I think the how is very, very important, building that framework to improve yourself and understand these complex ideas. So it's really summarizing maybe the most important things I learned and then how I learned things. The last part is talking about my future, which is what are my goals now that I've completed this goal? What do I want the future to be like? What's my plan for the next few years. So that's how this is split up. So without further ado, let's get into the first part of the section. My journey began in the summer of 2021. I just turned 24 and I was in my first job out of college as a business technology analyst at Deloitte. I completed my BA in economics and my master's in business analytics directly after both at the University of California, Irvine. I didn't have any real reason for choosing consulting other than the fact that I liked I could try out different projects and see different companies. I had options. But really, I had no idea what I wanted to do in life. I was making money and had a large degree of financial dependence really for the first time. I knew I should invest my money, but I didn't exactly know how to. I talked to my uncle at the time, who was a financial advisor, and he told me to stick with ETFs in the market rather than focus on particular stocks. I started doing my own research, trying to make my own portfolio. And I remember one summer, that the summer of 2021, I invested in ARK because I thought the fund was just so cool. I love that Kathy Woods was this woman succeeding in a male-dominant investment field. And I was like, hey, let me invest a few grand. And uh, if you look at the chart for ARC, you can see how absolutely atrocious my timing was on that trade. So that was my first real experience in the stock market, but was just really focused on investing. Now, at the same time, a close friend from college had also gotten a new job at this marketing research firm, but he hated it. I mean, he absolutely hated it. His extreme dissatisfaction with his current career prompted him to see how he can make a more enjoyable life for himself. Somehow he settled on trading. And for the next few months, the only thing he would tell me was about trading. I mean, I remember his excitement for steel stocks, like a kid opening Christmas gifts and finding a puppy. So through all these months, I entertained him, but trading was a lost cause, in my opinion. I mean, I just thought it was just all luck. Investing was really the only true way. And my friend just had to realize that 
working isn't so bad. You just got to get used to this new way of living. Thankfully, to the large benefit of my current self-writing this, my friend was pretty smart, and he had a pretty good eye for bullshit. He avoided a lot of the furus and the scams that commonly come with trading. And that fall, he told me about the small subreddit. It had only about 8 to 9k in subs, and it was called Real Day Trading. The founder, a trader named Hari Selden, had an 85% win rate and was crushing all of these insane challenges. And when I saw that, I knew that this could not be luck. There was just simply no way someone could achieve all of this with pure luck. Seeing those stats and those examples proved to me that trading was a learned skill. The more I read of the wiki at that time, all of the signals pointed into that direction. This is not playing the lottery. There is a way to make money through skill in this profession. The other thing that he pointed out, which I really liked, was that his goal wasn't to hit this giant fucking home run every single month. He wanted to hit singles, right? How do I consistently generate income month over month over month so it's reliable just like a paycheck? This is not a get-rich-quick scheme. This is a new job. In December of 2021, he told me about another source, a YouTube channel called One Option. I'll never forget his exact words. He said, the way this guy talks about trading just makes sense. I watched my first video and something clicked in my head when I heard Pete say, everything starts with the market. It was so obvious, but so ingenious. It was something I never even considered. I'll spend all my time bouncing around between different strategies, right? What's the best ETF portfolio mix? Can I only make money selling options? And I ended up missing the forest for the trees. Pete articulated his opinion with such clarity that even a beginner like me could tell that this information was priceless. And the reason for that was that his explanations weren't obtuse or convoluted. Any beginner could watch the video and get an idea of what the system is like. There's no secret sauce. There's no indicator. There's no strategy. It's just rock solid, iron tight reasoning, logic, and experience that are distilled in a clear way to make a very cohesive system. So at this point, I was pretty convinced that trading is possible, but I wanted to be 100% sure, right? I figured I'd wait to see what these guys were saying the next month, maybe the month after that. At the start of 2022, Pete was voicing his concerns about what he saw in the market. And if you go to the video, you'll see some of the main things he talked about, right? He saw the many tests of the SMA. He saw the lack of seasonality coming in during a very bullish period in the market, right? The holiday seasons. He was talking about the concern for inflation that the Fed was bringing up. And perhaps some other things. So at the time, I had like 15K invested in the, in the S&P 500, and I thought, yeah, whatever. I mean, who cares, right? It's, he's, just, he's just saying something. Now, in January 2022, I was proven very, very wrong, insane volatility in the market, and uh, lost a few grand, right? I wasn't, I mean, I could have held it throughout all the volatility, but mentally, I wasn't ready. I didn't know a shit. So I decided to take my lumps, take it all out of the market. I'm going to go in cash. And I figured that it'd be better served in some trading account than my current investment account. So I wanted some proof that they knew what they were talking about. And I got my proof. I spent most of January and February just binging all of Pete's videos, reading the entire wiki. Again, both sources, I got to say, just brutally honest, genuine, and clear. There are no shortcuts. What I was learning is the shortcut. It takes two years to match the system. Treat this seriously. Make it a business plan. We are proof that this way of living is possible. And if you're willing to put in the work, you can get to where we are. 
My gut told me that this path was more rewarding financially and even spiritually than my current job trajectory. It was something hard, and I liked doing something hard that challenged me and really made me grow. I also wanted to be good at something. I was okay at a lot of things in my life. I was good at a few things, but I never had and never put in the time to be really great at something. And this was something that I could see myself being really great at, provided I put in the work. I mean, pursuing to become a full-time trader, it seemed like a long and arduous road. And it, it is coming two years later. But the rewards just seem worth it. The financial independence, obviously the, the money that you make, but also the knowledge that you are mastering something very difficult and that some people even just consider fucking pure witchcraft, right? They don't even think that it's a real thing. So, I mean, sucks for them, but, you know, at the end of the day, some people are making more money, other people are not making as much money. So that's just really the clear-cut line in the sand. Now, I still had a job at this point, so I spent all my free time at work just glued to the markets. I was reading, I was watching videos. Hari had the live Twitter trading. Everything just learned, went to going to learning as much as I could about trading. I was absolutely hooked. My first trade was this lift long on paper. I went long 100 shares and I lost 50 bucks. And then I figured, let me just pivot short. And it made $342. And I remember vividly the first time I made this money, even though it was fake, I just thought I made money by literally just doing nothing. Like, I made $342 by doing absolutely nothing. I just clicked a sell button and then I waited and then I clicked a buy button, right? Like this is more money than I make in a normal day post, like pre-tax, right? Or maybe post-tax. It seems so easy and effortless. And looking back on the line of thinking and remembering that, uh, it's pretty funny because now I really know like all of the analysis and the contextual understanding that goes into this elaborate decision-making process that has been refined and refined and refined and chiseled like a fucking Michelangelo statue. So something there's there's some beautiful some beauty in that simplicity, and I hope I to get back uh, to that feeling of simplicity later down the road as a pro trader. So at the end of March, still at my job, and uh, I got the current opportunity that would ultimately lead me to quit my job, although I didn't know it at the time. So in consulting, you're on projects, and you go from project to project. When you're not in projects, you're in a waiting period, and we call that the bench. So I finished my current project at the end of March, and I was on the bench. And if I really wanted to, I could get on a project right away, which is what you're supposed to do. But I also knew that I could get away with waiting for a while. I didn't really have to get on a project. Um, and I could kind of milk this opportunity to see what it's like if I just pretended to be a trader, right? So for all of April and even all of May and a little bit of June, I woke up every day and I paper traded. I paper traded every single day. I went over all my trades. I logged all my trades in my journal. And it was just absolutely amazing. I mean, I loved every single day. I, I I remember like I woke up every single day happy to try to hone this process. It was so much fun. And just realizing the stark difference in my life compared to my current job where I mean, I had to wake up at East Coast time as well, you know, 6.30, but I got out of bed. I rolled out of bed, and I didn't even get out of bed sometimes. I would just take my laptop at 6.25 and open it for my 6.30 meeting. And just some days just absolutely just not, just just hating my job. I, I did not like it at some point, you know. So that stark difference really stuck with me. I'd also just joined one option. And I committed the thousand dollars to watching the pro channel real time. I think this is before the the system existed. I wanted the software, and I wanted the chat room. I thought it was worth the money. It was worth the investment. Once I put that money in, I think that was when my mind was made up. Because I actually con contributed a significant dollar amount at the time for me, 
uh, to taking on this new trajectory, to following this passion. And I figured that, hey, this is an investment, and I'm going to make this back in the future. This $1,000 is going to be worth it. Now, unfortunately, my beautiful time on the bench came to an end in early June, was finally put on a project, and it fucking sucked. I mean, going from full full time mock trading from two months for the for the past two months to a normal job, it was one of the biggest drops in happiness I've ever experienced in my entire life. It was like my soul was sucked out of my body. My life was filled with this freedom, this passion, this vibrancy, and it was reduced to that of this caged, monotonous drone. I was like this tiny cog in the wheel of capitalism. And I was still trying to trade when I was on my new project, but it was hard. My attention was divided, and I hated that the pace of my learning was slowed down, right? If you think of my learning as a trajectory, instead of going exponential, it was completely fucking flat, like the J&J chart right now. What also stung was just the idea that I felt I was wasting my time. When I was mock trading, I wasn't making any money, but it felt like every day I was slowly building towards a passion and a, and a dream. So it never felt like any any day was lost, even if I had a, a horrible day uh, in the market and I just made a bunch of lost trades and lost a bunch of money. When I was working there at Deloitte, I was like, I'm putting in all this work to something that I don't even like doing and I don't even want to go. And like, I, I, there's no... The path for me that this leads to is not a path that I want to go down. It was just, it just felt like a grievous misuse of my time to keep working there. Now, to make matters more complicated, my parents were very happy that I was working at Deloitte. I'm a first generation Indian immigrant. I was born in India, but mainly grew up here in the US. And from my experience, this Indian immigrant mission is really to find success in a risk-averse way. So my dad had worked for over 20 years at the time in the same company. He was steadily moving up the ranks to a very high position. He had a consistent salary that was growing you know, every year through every promotion. He made smart investments over time, and he was starting to reap the rewards by the time I got to college. So I felt this implied pressure to follow the same path. And I never questioned that pressure for a while because I didn't really have anything that I was strongly passionate about. You know, I was just like, yeah, I'm going to get good grades. I'm going to go to good college. I'm going to play tennis, going to have fun. Um, so I never was in an opportunity to deviate and question, uh, deviate from the path and really question it. But now I had a dream that kind of clashed with that paradigm. I mean, quitting a big four consulting job, right? A strong name brand, a job that a lot of people get, um, and a job that's, you know, actually has a lower acceptance rate than a lot of Ivy leagues. You know, this is not just your, it's not just a random job that you can just get. Um, it's, it's, uh, has a, has a status symbol attached to it. I knew that they're not going to like that. And it also be hard to explain to them that this is something that worked. It'd be different if I was switching from Deloitte to a KPMG, right? You're going from one name brand to another name brand. That's fine. But in my view, I thought that quitting this job and pursuing something that could or could not work would be a very, very scary thought for them. And just, you know, imagining that future scenario caused me a lot of anxiety. I got a lot, I'd, I'd gone through pretty much my entire life without doing anything controversial in their eyes, right? I've always followed their advice and they never given me bad advice. It was out of love. It was out of wanting to be genuinely happy and wanting me to be financially secure and promote my well-being above everything else. And because of the risk averse nature, it naturally manifested itself through these traditional paths of excellence, business, medicine, law, something along those lines. But entrepreneurship was never on the table. It would, that would be a great risk in their minds. We're not a family of entrepreneurs, right? There's no arts, there's no sports, and there's certainly no trading. It's just too risky. So with all of this in mind, I had to really make the ultimate bet on myself. 
if I wanted to be a trader, how much did I believe I could do this? Was it worth quitting my job and going against what my family believed? What would happen if I fail? What would be my backup plan? Right? Was this risk worth the reward? My first gen Indian immigrant culture would say no. But my new logic really felt like this was a no brainer. Career aspirations didn't really mean anything to me. It was an empty status symbol. I felt that the reason most people worked was because they had to survive. People don't really work for free. And if they did, that's volunteering. If you got $200,000 a year for free by doing nothing, would you take that deal? A lot of people would. The question that people don't really have the answer to is what would you do at that time? What, if you do, what would you do if you just had the money and you didn't work? You didn't have to work. What would you do? A lot of people didn't have the answer to that, especially if they were very, very career focused because their career and their sustenance through their career was the number one thing. Now, I'm not saying that this is like the most realistic thought experiment, but it highlighted what people placed values on. And for me, ultimately, money is a means to an end. It's not the true answer to happiness. Time was the true commodity, and how I spent time mattered because I can't get it back. There's no way around me needing money, right? I can't change the entire economic system. But now there's another path available, and a path that is proven. It's not that I'm forging my own trail ahead, right? Like that Pete had to do 20 years ago when he quit his job and decided to become trading full time. The path is already there. It's laid out. All you need is some basic level of intelligence, a lot of hard work, a lot of smart work, and a lot of time. I didn't have to be another cog in the corporate wheel because I saw that there was so clearly another way for me to live that is viable and is so much better than what I was experiencing at the moment. I had the ability and had the choice to earn money in a way that, was, that would make me happy and would make me free. So June is in full swing. I was in my project and I was despising it more and more every single day. And it got to the point where I felt I'd rather be unemployed than work another day. It just wasn't worth it. And then finally in July, I put in my two weeks. And really in truth, as soon as I started my new project in June, a few weeks ago, I wanted to quit. But I decided to stick it out for another month and I hoping that this would change and seeing if it would change, but it didn't. And it felt useless and pointless to continue to stick it out any further. Now, this was a little bit rash, but it wasn't like I had no plan at all. I just moved back home because I wanted to save money on rent and food. I knew that my income would obviously go down, but if my costs go down, then I'm still doing okay. I just needed enough money to cover my Spotify subscription. In the past few months, I'd also created a business plan that would outline my decision for leaving. It, it, took, it took into account you know, how long I plan to spend doing this trade, right? If I was, you know, I couldn't be doing nothing for 10 years, hoping that something would go through. I needed some sort of timeline to say that, hey, you know, if this is not working after two or three years, then I, I got to get out and do something else. I would also see, hey, how can I make some income on the side? And if it does fail, then what do I go back to? in terms of jobs? What do I pivot to? And I, I did plan to show this to my family in the hopes of explaining my situation and explaining the thought process behind my situation to convey that this isn't rash, but something that is thought out and deliberated on over many, many months. But ultimately, 
it just comes down to a leap of faith. You can do all this planning, you do all this deliberation, and that's important because it gives you confidence to make the leap. But at the end of the day, you got to pull the trigger. You got to pull it in the two weeks, you got to quit the job, and you got to go full time. And you need a plan in order to do that. And you got to leap according to that plan. It wasn't easy. Did I truly believe I could make it? What was I willing to do in order to achieve financial freedom? That leap answered that question. Taking the leap. Before I get into this night, I want to preface that me and my parents get along pretty well. We have a good relationship. They're loving, they're kind, they're generally open, and they're hardworking people. And I wouldn't choose any other set of parents. But I do want to talk about this night in particular because I view it as a glimpse of good people overreacting to unexpected news in a way that doesn't portray how they usually are. This is pretty difficult, I think, for me to talk about because it's very personal. And to be perfectly frank, it's a night that I'd kind of rather forget. It's not the emotional joy <laughs> or peak that I really strive to have. So just the fact that I can't even think of the right way to talk about should give a sense of um, my hesitation to talk about this. But I think in the spirit of giving the full picture of the story, it's important to talk about this night because I feel that it set the tone for my mindset and my work ethic that kind of drove me to where I am today. So let's get into this. It was a cool summer night in mid-July. Like I said before, this is a night I'd rather forget. And speaking this out is painful for me. I was sitting in my room, nervous to confront my parents about the truth. I'd put in my two weeks at my job, and it was halfway through my last week. I hadn't told them yet that I was going to quit. I had my laptop, and I had a business plan open that I made on PowerPoint. I played out the entire conversation about 100 times in my head. I knew that they would be beyond upset, but I also knew that I had thought about this carefully, I had my reasons for doing so, and I hoped that my reason and rationale could show them that I was doing something in my best interest. I had to stand my ground, and I had to be firm in my dream. So I got out of my room and went up to my dad. He was watching TV on the couch, wrapped up in a cozy blanket. I paused for a moment. Noticing my hesitation, he asked if everything was all right. A lump was already forming in my throat, but I saw I managed to squeak out the words. I'm quitting my job at Deloitte. His face, previously a content, carefree gaze, quickly transfigured to a mix of shock, disbelief, and horror. What? he said. I quit my job at Deloitte, I said again, unable to meet his gaze. His face was now visibly upset. Mom, he yelled, did you hear about this? No? What? My mom shouted from the bedroom, rushing through the door to meet us. I have a plan and I wanted to show you it, I mumbled. How could you quit your job? Just when things were settling down with your brother, and now this happens? The tone in the room was palpably uncomfortable, and they just hadn't heard a word I just said. I repeated my last sentence, and they begrudgingly agreed to see my plan. I connected my laptop to the TV, and I began walking them through it. I showed them my current progress, my risk mitigation strategies, the backup plans of a failed trading. I showed them my current stats and how it's improving. And I told them that I didn't hate my job, but this was just better. All of this went straight over their heads. 
to be honest, I could have showed them pictures of giraffes for 20 minutes and it would have had the same reaction. Their emotional distress was too high to rationally comprehend anything I was really saying. Are you on margin? My dad asked, ignoring everything I had said previously. Yes, I replied, puzzled. Now, impossibly, his face contorted into more grief. You could lose more money than you have. People could come to your house and break your legs to get money. Dad, that doesn't happen, I said. And I'm also just trading one share, so I'm not using my margin. I'm not going to lose all my money. Again, like all the other statements, this was seemed to go in through one ear and out the other ear. Turning to my mom, he said, we're going to have to take him out of the will if something happens to him. If his money is tied to us, we could lose the house and even more things. I wasn't expecting this, and I was genuinely stunned and, quite frankly, insulted at this point, thinking, they're just going to take me out of the will because I quit my job to trade? It's not like I fucking murdered someone. But at this point, I said nothing. I thought it'd be better just to let the whole situation play out. And I was too afraid to poke this bear even more. It was already emotionally draining enough to show an entire plan and have nothing to actually sink through their feeling. After maybe a dozen or so more looks at despair, the night had concluded, and I went back to my room, and I closed my door, and laid on my bed. I wasn't sure how I could sleep. I closed my eyes, but I heard the sound of my dad slamming doors and yelling in frustration. I felt like absolute shit. My heart had been sucked into a black hole. Every single doubt about trading was replaying in my mind like TV reruns. Was this a mistake? Did I seriously fuck up? This is something I had to do, right? And after hours or minutes of circulating thoughts, I'm not quite sure, I managed to drift to sleep. Only to be woken at, at 3 a.m. to my dad barging in my room and reading me the definition of Wikipedia, of day trading on Wikipedia. He was showing me, look, it says right here, it's actively speculative. There's nothing to it. My 3 a.m. brain, <laughs> was sleep deprived and emotionally burdened, uh, found this annoying and also sort of amusing. Did he really think that the definition of day trading on Wikipedia would change everything? As if I hadn't considered that, but when I made my decision, as if it erased everything I saw from Pete, Hari, and Dave over the past few months. Dad, this is not true. I can show you. Again, he said nothing. Went through an ear, went through one ear, out the other ear. We both went back to bed. So I laid in bed again, now at the same point that I was before earlier in that night, just trying to process what happened. In a single night, a massive chip had emerged on my shoulder. It really felt that they didn't understand my thought process and my reasoning and what I was going through. I really had no one to turn to. I remembered one of Hari's posts on Mindset, and specifically Mindset External. It talked about the external pressures of pursuing trading. And in that night, I kept rereading the last part of that post. Quote, And if they still don't get it after that, fuck them. Seriously, fuck them. You don't need that kind of negativity in your life, and you certainly don't need that lack of support. You can't let it impact you. Those sentences were my beacon of hope for the next few weeks. I drifted to sleep again, waking up to the sound of my alarm. It was 6 a.m. and I'd barely slept a wink. The market opens in 30 minutes. Time to start my first day of real trading. Now, my first day of trading was normal enough. Usual process, market first, looking for stocks, checking the chat. But the nights, the events that transpired the night before were still fresh. My dad had called up several people to get their advice on me trading. I spoke to two wealth management professionals that my dad knew. The first told me that he used to be an options broker 
and trading is risky compared to investing, which is a far more consistent and reliable alternative. The other wealth management advisor told me he knew three friends who tried. Two failed and one made it. That one person retired and is living his life. He said it is possible, but extremely hard. I talked to my uncle who worked in financial consulting before turning into a pilot and then operating his own boutique financial advisory firm. I'd come to him earlier for investment advice before. He also seemed to misunderstand my reasons. He thought I was just looking for a thrill and advised me that there were plenty of things outside of trading that could get that thrill. I could still have a job and I could still get, you know, the excitement out of my system through another means. And then finally, I talked to my older cousin. He had suffered the consequences of trading big. He had all the necessary experience on paper, right? He was very smart, graduated from NYU Stern, ex Lehman Brothers employee. He had big wins, but he had even bigger losses. And he ended up having to sell his apartment to cover some of those trading losses. And what he told me was, I lacked the emotional intelligence at the time to trade properly. The experience was valuable and he learned a lot, but ultimately he failed he still bore some of those emotional scars to this day. Now, out of all those conversations, my cousin's was the least infuriating. He at least seemed to understand the non-financial benefits I could reap from this journey. All my other conversations were a gentle nudge to not do this, and I didn't want to waste my time trying to convince them. Everyone was basically telling me that this was a bad idea, and it was really a, a gigantic slap in the face when I was already down, when I was already in doubt. But I kept reminding myself that there was one thing I had over all of them, which was I'd seen a systematic approach that worked. I'd seen relative strength and relative weakness work day in and day out. And I believe that if they spent two weeks in the real day trading chat or the one option chat following Harry on Twitter, I think they would also see that this is credible and viable. I wasn't trying to reinvent the wheel. The wheel already existed, and I'm just learning how to drive. So on day two, the huge chip on my shoulder from last night's events had grown even bigger. I was more determined than ever to prove every single person who didn't believe me wrong. It was me against them, and like Michael Jordan, I took it personally that they bet against me. And I didn't care how long it took. I wanted to achieve my dream. I think this chip was a double-edged sword looking back. It was this wellspring of motivation that translated into relentless studying, trading, and refining. But this relentless pursuit and this chip on my shoulder also became one of the main mindset obstacles that I had to overcome. In the next section, I'm going to talk more about the journey, and you'll see where this mindset reveals its ugly head. The ups and downs of the journey. The point of this section is to get a month by month view of my journey from zero to one share consistently for three months. This is going to be a long section, but I wanted to include this section because as amazing as our community is, I haven't seen a detailed view of going from novice to one share. So this section is my attempt to fill in that gap. This journey isn't straightforward, and there's going to be a roller coaster of progress. This is my personal experience. You don't have to do any of the things that I say here. But if you're still learning or if you're stuck, then hopefully you'll get some ideas of what to try. A useful metaphor for this process is building a ship to sail. When you start, you have the ship, right, and you really want to sail get to the island, get some treasure. So you try to sail, but then you realize you're sinking because your ship is full of holes. So you go back to the dock and you plug in the hole, right? You find every single hole you can, you try to plug it in. Go out to sail again. Turns out you didn't plug it in that well. Sea gets kind of choppy, the holes break, and your ship sinks, go back to the dock. So this time you fortify even more. Instead of getting wood, now you're going for steel. You steel fortify the holes. The ship's moving a little bit. And seas are getting pretty calm. You decide, hey, 
now I'm ready to sail. So you go out again, and then the ship sinks. It's like, nope, more holes came in. So eventually you repeat this process over and over and over again, again. And you go from this little, you know, shoddy looking wooden boat to an imperial class iron hull that can survive choppy seas, big waves, and extreme weather. It's taken two years. You've gotten really good at building your ship and plugging every single hole. You're confident that it's not going to sink because you've gone through this process many times. When you're finally ready to sail, you're ready to get some treasure. So let's start in the beginning. I'm a full-time training student, no income, a massive chip on my shoulder, and a dream. Let's start with some of this context from the previous section. My parent thinks I'm crazy for leaving the job. They're very upset with me. They're very mad, and I feel like complete shit. I've talked to several financial advisors who all told me I was in over my head, and I'm probably not going to succeed in this position. My friends were supportive, but also probably pretty cautious. So not a lot of support going on my side. The only support I had was the single friend who was also trading uh, while he had his job. So the first part of this kind of starts in June when I still had my job. And it's going to start with me being an idiot. And I think that's how, loud, that's how a lot of trading journeys start. So I had some success trading uh, MES, so the SPY E mini futures on paper. And I felt pretty good, right? I was having a pretty good win rate and I was profitable. I don't think I was a 2.0 factor profitable. It was probably something like 70% and 1.5. And so I felt pretty good. So in June, I was trading real MES shorts on my TD Ameritrade account. And I was loading up on MES shorts while the market was forming a base in the massive drop of June 2022. So remember those days, there was a big, uh, huge, huge, huge drop. I mean, it was just big gap down, big gap down, big gap down. Market dropped like 10% or something like that. And it formed this massive base over the course of June and the beginning of July. And I was averaging down on this position that started to go against me. There was one night that the market was moving up higher and I just couldn't sleep. I knew I was oversized. I was so nervous about the position and mentally I knew that this is not the right place to be. So I created a mental stop and I said, look, if SPY breaks to stop, I'm just going to take the L and I'm going to close the position. It happened. I took a 10K loss on a 25K account. So I took almost a 50% loss because I was averaging down on SPY futures in a bear market with only six months of experience. So that's just me being an idiot. However, realizing that I was oversized and creating that mental stop was probably the best decision I made in that entire trade is cutting a losing trade <laughs> at that point. So um, I guess props to me for taking that L instead of blowing up the entire account. Another example of me scaling up too fast like an idiot was following Hari on this Tesla short. So this was sometime in June, and I took a one contract Tesla put. Tesla would pull back, and then I averaged it on the position, so I averaged down. Again, mindset mistake. It kept going against me, and I was completely shitting my pants. In the last hour of trading, I was in my apartment and had to drive back home. And I remember while I was driving back home, I was literally refreshing Thinkorswim every few minutes on my phone to see the price on the ride home. The next day, Tesla dropped and I took the win in the open and I was happy I managed to profit on the trade. I think I made like 1600 and I'm dropping another few bucks and brought my puts to 5k. And then I started kicking myself for not holding longer. That's when I realized that I can copy a trade, but I can't copy a trader's conviction. I got lucky, and it could have been horribly wrong, but I realized that I got lucky, and that was a lesson that stuck in my head. So now here I am. My account's maybe you know 16K-ish, um, down from 25K, and I didn't have any faith in what I was doing. <laughs> So I was using my entire account to trade one ES position. I was oversizing trading SPY futures as a beginner who was not consistently profitable. I was in way over my fucking head, right? And after three or four scalps, when you know every second of a five or ten minute can trade consisted of paralytic levels of anxiety, I prudently realized that this is no way to trade. Why am I rejecting everything I learned in the wiki? It was my ego, right? I just thought that I could trade MES, I could trade SPY futures. 
So luckily, it didn't cost me my whole account. But I do think that everyone has some sort of story where they need to be humbled. And I think, in my personal experience, the faster you be humbled and you get to this method, the quicker that you are going to be profitable. I needed to get back to PD, PDT to trade one share. And I needed to do this well. So it's probably wiser to go back to paper, but it was still wiser to trade one share of real stock um, than to do than to continue to do what I was doing. So I asked my cousin if I could borrow 10k to make it over PDT so that way I could day trade. I didn't tell him how I lost the money, but I did say, look, I want to pay you back within the next year. I was back at 25k, and now I swore that I would not make the same mistakes as I did again. It had cost me 10k, but I had learned my lesson. So now we're in July. We get through this. We get through the talk with my parents and all these financial advisors, and part of them had a point because I was kind of an idiot in some ways um, for not having for quitting my job in that way and having this sort of Dunning Kruger confidence. But I learned my lesson and I was smart enough to be trading one share. And I also knew that I had to be accountable. So I started to make some posts in real day trading. Uh, the first one was kind of in July about my journey. And then I had a later post in December of that year after one year of trading. I also had an Instagram account where I posted updates first weekly and then monthly. And I needed to put my goal out to the world because everyone would know whether I succeeded or failed. And it gave me extra incentive to perform. Although not that I really needed it at that point. Like I mentioned earlier, despite my differences with my dad, he was spot on about one thing. In his point in my plan, he said, look, you're extrapolating pretty heavily from one month of paper trading. And I realized that I did sort of lie when I talked to him. Not lie, but misunderstand myself. I told him that I didn't hate my job. The real reason was I did hate my job because it was much worse relative to trading. I also had Doug and Cougar confidence where I was extrapolating heavily after one great month of paper trading. But to assuage some of his pleas, I agreed to take this part-time job as a consultant for an Indian farm tech startup. So it was a startup he was advising. He said that they could use this help and I was able to, uh, you know, at least get some income on the side to cover my expenses. It was less than 20% of my original Deloitte income, but it didn't take much time. And he preferred me to do that versus being a weekend Uber driver, which was my original plan to earn income. So here I am now. I have a part-time job. I'm making maybe a thousand bucks a month. And I'm just focusing on trading full-time, learning everything that I can every single day. October came around and I took a hundred trades that month. I was trying to manage multiple positions and I couldn't do it well. I was also trading with scared money. Most of my picks were subpar and I analyzed my journals and from analyzing my journal, I realized that if I just stuck with a handful of a few good picks every day, I would have been way more profitable with far less effort. If I just cut my 100 trades down to maybe 20 or 30 trades, but the ones that were really good, I wouldn't. it would be so much easier mentally because I don't have to manage all these positions and far more profitable. So that was the first thing I learned in October. The second thing I was also focusing on was my mindset. The other thing I noticed was that I was trading scared and I would never let my winners ride and I would take very small profits on my winners and very big profits on my losers. So I was determined to solve this problem and I deemed that to be the reason for my poor trading. So I read Trading in the Zone, I read Best Loser Wins, and they helped me understand myself better, but they didn't help me actually trade better. But I knew that I had to overcome certain personality flaws to improve my trading. I need to understand what was driving the poor decision making so I could address the root cause of the problem rather than applying these band-aid solutions. I read another book that I think really helped me, and this was Thinking in Bets by Annie Duke. 
And this book helped me because it got to a more fundamental or core idea with regards to trading and even life. And it's that what we're doing is probabilistic in nature. Nothing is guaranteed in the short run. But when you take any basic stats course, you can get something very predictable in the long run, even though something is very random in the short run. It also made me understand that distilling skill from luck in a black box process like trading takes time. Because you can't honestly say that you won any single trade on skill if you don't have the stats to back it up. You have to look at dozens of trades over a statistically relative sample size before you can say it was skill and luck. There's a lot of factors that you have to tease out, right? What's the market doing? Did I give a good stock pick? What was my, what was my, did I add or did I not add to the position? So her experience with poker was very relevant to my trading. And the information was, ve was honestly fantastic. And I realized that I need to create something actionable with it. So I started, daily, I started journaling daily in the notes app on my phone. So it wasn't trading specifically, but it offered a means for me to subjectively psychoanalyze myself. It was through this that I was able to identify my personality quirks that proved to be a barrier to trading. Getting my thoughts to paper or keyboard made them concrete, and it forced me to face them, organize them, and understand them. And after doing this for a couple of weeks, this is my takeaway. Who I was as a person affects who I am as a trader. So as a person, I generally lacked confidence, and I people-pleased. Dealing with interpersonal conflict was anxiety-inducing. My lack of confidence didn't only extend to trading, but it extended to all other aspects of my life. Playing tennis, trying to talk to girls, even playing Super Smash Bros. <laughs> so at first, I was like, this seems to be a pretty big problem. But then I realized it's actually the opposite. Because this is not a one-way street, it's a two-way street. So I could do many different things in my life that could affect who I was as a person. So I called this cross training where I could basically improve one area of my life and that could positively affect the other area of my life. So if I could change my mindset in different areas like trading or socializing, then that would have positive mental spillover effects. Oh, sorry, not trading. Positive aspects like tennis or socializing, that would have a positive spillover mentally to trading. So how do I put all this together? So this kind of combines the psychoanalysis with what I was thinking with Andy Dukes, thinking in bets. So let's take a situation where I want to approach a girl who I think is cute. Now the old me would steal a couple of looks, maybe grab a few drinks, think he could summon some liquid courage, and then go home and do nothing. What would the new me do? So I know I'm going to this nervous because I expect this to work out. But now that I expect, but now my new framework of the world is probabilistic. There's some probability I succeed. There's some probability I fail. Well, it's success. Maybe success is like, hey, I get her number. And if I fail, I might feel embarrassed. But ultimately, my life is unchanged. To put it in Tom Hugard's words, I'm in a situation where I'm fearful, where I should be hopeful. Now, I also know that this is a numbers game. This, this is not the only girl who I think is cute. I've seen dozens of girls in my life who I think are attractive. And you'll need a few successes to gain confidence. So even if I get rejected 30 times, having five successes will give me confidence. So now my expectation is, hey, this is probably going to fail, but there is a small chance of success and there's no real downside to the failure. Now you take this framework and you see how it applies to trading. I'm not trading low probability big payoff events, something like a lotto. But I am applying these ideas of success or failure and expected value into trading, and I cross-train that from my real life. So now let's bring it back to trading. In November, I had this new mindset that I'm kind of going into, and 
I am overcorrecting in the other way. Because I overtraded in October, I said, hey, in November, I am going to give myself only one bullet, only one trade each day. If it was a bad trade, it's a bad trade. So this would limit my winners, but would also dramatically cut down my losers. And the results were startling. I mean, I spent all my efforts picking a single trade and making sure it was best. Now, there's some trades that I wanted to take, and I noted, and I made a note of that, and I tracked them separately. And I said, all right, well, here's my intuition of a trade that I like, but I won't have one bullet. Let me see and track all these trades that I think are right and see if they actually end up being right. This was a huge, huge milestone in my trading journey because it underscored the importance of less is more. So I made this process in December as well. Uh, and my PL was improving, and not my PL, but also my stats, right? My win rate was going up, my profit factor was also increasing. I wasn't quite at the 75% win rate and 2.0 profit factor, but it was a huge leap from where I was before in October, where I had probably a one profit factor and a 50% win rate. January came along, and I hit my first month of a 75% win rate and profit factor of two on one share entirely. So I think I had an 80% win rate and a uh, 4.0 profit factor. And this was a huge milestone. It was the first sign of success or progress in six months. I had also started posting my picks in the chat at that time, feeling that it would force me to further improve my trade selection. But I hadn't escaped my Dunning-Kruger confidence just yet, because as soon as I finished January, I had some thoughts about how would I scale up, and this was the same problem I had in May, where I was taking a great month and extrapolating this out very far in the future, when I just didn't have enough data to justifiably think uh, those thoughts, right? There's a couple things that I missed in this month looking back. So first, a lot of the picks were Dave picks, maybe about half or so. And because they were Dave picks, I was thinking, hey, I don't just want to be a copycat, right? I want to have my own picks and I want to say, hey, look, he might offer a pick and I'm going to evaluate this pick on my own and try to do well with it. But at the same time, knowing that he also looked at this stock and vetted it and is in the stock and bet money on it, gives me an extra sense of confidence. It's like another checkbox in a way, right? Here's all my analysis, and oh look, Dave also did the pick. So another checkbox. Dave always wins a trade, right? Um, so when you are copying a trade, and this is the same thing that happened with the Hari situation, you can copy the trade, but you can't copy the conviction. So I was posting my picks in the chat, but I couldn't maintain my confidence in February when the market conditions changed from bullish to neutral. I still had a great win rate, but my profit factor plummeted to break even. And I started scratching out of more and more trades just because I had no trust in my conviction. So I was thinking to myself, why don't I have confidence in my picks if I had a 75% win rate and 2.0 profit factor? What's the reason? I should have some trust at least. I've done it for a month. So then I went back into digging. The first part was that I had a poor ability to read SPY intraday and a poor ability to recognize changing market conditions. So I said in February or in March, I'm going to make predictions on SPY. I'm going to track those predictions and see how often I'm right. The second thing is that I am going to post less in the chat because I'm using the chat as a crutch when it should be something additive. And the thought process that I went through was, how much am I adding to the chat if not all of my picks are unique? If you think about a professional trader, they add far more to the one option chat than they take away from. Someone like me takes away far more from the one option chat than he adds to. So how can I get to the other side? And what I realized was that I needed to take a step back and 
develop my own confidence in my picks separate from the chat. So I started posting less and started looking at the chat less because I needed to develop my own confidence in my own picks. So March came around and I started tracking spy and my picks. And I saw that, hey, after 40 or so trades in that month, I was right 75% of the time on spy. So my market read was getting a lot better. I was able to understand what was going on intraday. Now it was a small sample, but it was helpful because it offered a framework for improvement. I identified a problem. I'm going to track my prediction of that problem, see how I do, and then see what I can improve. So slowly, slowly, I was getting better, even though I wasn't quite getting to my 75% win rate and 2.0 profit factor. Now I'm going to take a step back from training here and go back into the context of my real life. So I was a couple of months into that part-time job that I'd taken in July, and it was pretty bad at paying me. It would not pay me on time. I had lingering credit card debt, and I realized that I needed to get another way. I needed another way to make money. My dad had recently started getting into tennis again. So I played tennis my entire life. I watch videos. I've done data stuff. I've read articles on tennis technique. I had a pretty deep understanding of the game, and I thought I could make a pretty good coach. So I brought it up to him, and he talked to his coach, who agreed to meet with me. He gave me some beginner students, and I had 10 lessons a week. It wasn't a ton of money because we would split the profits in the lessons, but I had a consistent cash flow, and I also had a more income that I could use to pay off the debt that I'd honestly got in the first place. It was also very flexible. So I made sure all my lessons were after the market so I could trade in the morning and teach tennis in the afternoon. I kept my weekends free for studying and relaxing. Teaching tennis was very important to me because it realized a couple of lessons. The first was around February or March, I'd gotten a little burned out from hyper-focus on trading. It had been over a year, and I felt like I was getting better, but I struggled immensely. I mean, I just had nothing to show for it. Teaching tennis brought a little bit of balance to my life. Teaching beginners from scratch was a new and fun problem that I liked solving. The second part that was great to me was that it flipped me in the role of the expert. In trading, I was an absolute beginner. And when I'd see Peter or Hari comment, I'm saying, all right, they're the expert. They know what they're talking about. And I need to learn from them. In tennis, I experienced this role reversal where I had all this information in my mind on how to play the game and how to teach. The process of teaching beginners forced me to organize and rethink all this information in my head in a way that would improve the players on a step-by-step -step basis. I knew that tennis is a hard sport, and it takes time to put all the pieces together. My brain was still hardwired to learn training at this point, and it was just natural that I made comparisons between the two. So let me talk about a comparison here. I already mentioned that trading is complex and tennis is complex. They have that in common. In tennis, every ball and every player is different. You can't quite teach context, but I could teach a systematic decision-making process for what to do on each shot. In order to be a good tennis player, you need good strokes, you need good footwork. These are technical requirements. And then you need the right decision-making process to execute the right shot for the right situation. There are certain shots where you can get more aggressive and certain shots where you are more defensive. Each shot has a different risk-reward profile. The nature of this profile comes down to the technical ability of the students. So teaching beginners forced me to organize and titrate all of this knowledge and experience into actionable bite-sized building blocks on a lesson-by-lesson -lesson basis. To be decent at one skill requires several lessons and putting several Lego pieces together. And it took a while, but I could see it was making progress steadily. Every time we did a lesson, the student would slowly get better and better at some aspect of the game, perhaps it's forehand, perhaps it's backhand, perhaps it's footwork. And it was very fulfilling for me to do this. It was very fulfilling for me to help them. I was comparing how I felt in tennis to what I imagined Pete feeling in trading. 
he is this expert and as he's writing out the system he is doing the same thing that i am how does he organize and distill all the information and experience that he's learned over the years he knows that there's no substitute for experience reading about trading won't make you any better at trading just like reading about tennis won't make you any better at tennis it's important to have this information because it offers a framework for what to do but you also have to practice applying that knowledge into your actions again like trading tennis has a long runway to competency there's so many pieces that the student has to be proficient at to even play a match well my goal for my students is for them to be a USTA 4.0. And I knew that it would probably take my students two to four years to reach that goal. In tennis, I am the expert and the students are the learners on the path. In trading, Pete is the expert and I am the student on the path. Having this role reversal brought a great deal of peace and equanimity regarding the speed of my improvement. This is going to get into the mindset part of it as well. The chip on my shoulder and the driving or the, the what was driving all of my hard work and burnout was the fact that I needed to become a trader before two years. That was this assumption I had for my ego, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit here. But... When I put myself in the eyes of the coach and I realized that this person, if they tra if they play tennis once or twice a week, is going to take them two or three years to reach a goal, I realized that it would be the same for me as trading. My speed of improvement, I cannot learn any faster than I can learn. One small win every day will compound exponentially over time. And... I can't, it's like I can't rush the progress of my stock selection any more than my student could rush the progress of her backhand. It's a function of hard work and smart work. Now, all of this is great from a mental and emotional perspective, but I still had technical work to do, right? I didn't have any major signs of progress in my normal stats, my win rate, my profit factor. But I was realized that they were revealing myself through subtler stats. One of my main axioms was not making the same mistake two months in a row. I had to make different mistakes. This comes back to what I did in October to November. In October, I overtraded. In November, I said, what if I undertrade? What if I do the exact opposite? In March or in February, I talked about how I was lacking conviction in my trades. So in March, I said, well, what if I had so much conviction in my trades that I held them for way too long? What would that be like? This overcorrecting allows me to see both sides of the spectrum. And then I could kind of dial in to some sort of medium. The other thing I realized and putting the pieces together from Annie Duke's Thinking in Bets was that I was so focused on maximizing profits when I wasn't focused on maximizing probabilities. That was the key realization I made in March. I should maximize probabilities, not profits. And if I maximize probabilities, I will indirectly maximize my profits. So I looked at Dave, Dave's high quality criteria. And I started to grade my trades according to criteria. I said, all right, I want to take most of my trades according to Dave's high probability criteria. So in April, I met those goals. But I noticed that even though I took 60 trades a month, not all of them were high probability. I had to trim some fat. Another analogy, and you see I'm making a lot of analogies to trading, uh, to a lot of different things, but... The trades you take is like eating food. Most charts are junk food, and eating too much will leave you feeling pretty sick. Your PL is going to drop. High probability food, high probability trades are like big nutritious meals. A lot of nutrients, veggies, fruits, nuts, meats. There are less of them, but they leave you feel amazing. 
So in April, I realized that I had to change my trade diet. So I went back to doing one trade a day, the same as November, but now I'm trying to put everything together that I learned in the past few months. May came around. This is May of 2023. I read the mental game of trading, and I liked the approach that Jared Tendler was doing. It was very actionable and more nuanced than what was happening in trading in the zone or best loser wins. He had this detailed plan of changing root mindset causes that influence trading decisions. One of the exercises that I did was mapping emotional awareness. So every 30 minutes, I took a note on how I felt. I made a detailed list of all the common emotions, greed, fear, tilt, confidence, discipline, their triggers, their warning signs. I needed to get to know myself more. The role of this mapping and data collection, emotional data collection, I realized that fear was my biggest problem and diving into the root was that into the root of that fear was where I found my last and final mindset obstacle. Interestingly, my friend uh, who was in psychology school at the time really described this as a cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT. So what was this obstacle? Now, fear means you're afraid of something and in trading we don't like losing because the loss will represent something to the average person versus a seasoned trader. Now, what this represents is different for everybody. Some people don't like the money. Some people don't like the status. They lose confidence and conviction. In my case, every loss symbolized progress. Getting to a 75% win rate in three straight for three straight months was my singular focus, right? And I and think about everything I've done and talked about to get to this point, right? I quit my job, I moved back home, was yelled and discouraged by my family, I was discouraged by financial veterans, and I traded like I had to prove them wrong. Every win meant I was right, and every loss meant I was wrong, and they were right. A loss meant that I wasn't good enough. A loss meant that I was an idiot for choosing my dreams. I had so much doubt at this time that... I couldn't, affect, I couldn't really accept the fact that, like everything else in life, there was a chance that I could give this 120% and still completely and utterly fail. I just somehow internalized that a loss doesn't mean I'm a bad trader any more than a win meant I'm a good trader. A single loss and a single win are just that, a single loss and a single win. You have to look at what happened throughout many trades, many losses, and many wins. This is something that I knew about, but again, like I talked about in learning and reading, I've read this before, I've read the wiki, I've read the entire mindset section, but I had to experience this and then go back to those sections and now reread them with this new context, this new experience that I've had. And this is the back and forth process of reading and applying, reading and applying this iterative process where you start to contextualize really what they're saying in their words because they're coming from experience. And when you read them as a beginner, you just don't have the experience to contextualize what they're saying truly. It just gives you a roadmap or a framework from which you can drive through. So I mentioned that a law spent that I wasn't good enough. That is probably the core of it and it has to come down with your ego. I think like many traders, I've been good at many things in my life. I was pretty good at school. I was pretty good at tennis. I was pretty good at my job and consulting. People tell me that I would be good at things and I like that and I like being good at something. My ego thought the same would be true of trading. I would do this just like school or tennis or consulting. And, you know, it would be a little bit tough at first, but then I'd learn how to do it and I'd be good at it. As I mentioned earlier, I had this drive to prove everyone wrong and finish in less than two years because it would mean that I was better than everyone. That's what I really wanted. I wanted to be better than all the people who said that I would not get to where I was or where I wanted to be. When I posted my picks to my chat, every win would boost my ego and every loss would hurt my ego. 
And despite Jared Tendler's excellent book, it didn't help me confront my ego. It was this, I believe it was this wild beast that had to be tamed. And this was kind of the final piece of the mental puzzle to me. What is my ego? Why is it getting in the way of my dream? So now June came around. And through sheer luck, I would say, I stumbled across this app called Waking Up by Sam Harris. And Sam Harris, if you don't know him, he's a popular speaker, popular writer, popular philosopher, and so on. And this was the first week of June. And I remember that I just had a string of losses. I mean, just like out of 12 trades, maybe I had like 10 losses. It was just like nothing was just able to go. And I was just like, damn, like all this work again, just hitting this awfully terrible losing run. So I found this book. It was on a YouTube short. He was talking about it or not this book, this app. And I was like, all right, well, let me check out this app, right? Let me just see what's going on in the name of mindset, in the name of improving my trading. I will look at anything that will get me to where I want to be. So I've done some meditation before. And, you know, I was focusing on my breathing. I was focusing on quieting my mind and listening to birds and all that kind of stuff. Um, I think this was a very different app than what I expected. So before I get into this any further, this is my personal experience with this app and how it helped me go through the mindset puzzle. Not saying you got to do it, but if you're curious, check it out. See what works. So in Sam's words, and what really stuck with me is that your mind is what you bring to everything you do, right? You are your mind in some way, right? What you like, what you don't like, what you're good at, what you're bad at, what you're fearful of, what you're greedy of. It's all this product really of your mind. And meditation is simply a tool subjectively to view your mind to understand your mind better. And this really fit into the theme of what I was trying to do for these last two months, understanding who I was and why am I the way that I am. And if it's going to get philosophical and it sounds philosophical, well, that's because it is, right? And because in the process of chasing this goal and failing, I was going back to the drawing board and further regressing, regressing this idea of who am I really, right? And why am, why am I the way that I am? And is it possible to change that? So one of the insights that I guess you can get from meditation, if you pay careful enough attention, and that's really what meditation is, is paying attention to your experience in this moment. There's no religious aspect of it. Um, it basically builds upon the gems of wisdom and paying attention from many millennia and many teachers, but without the piousness that often comes bundled with it. So it took a while and I was but I was very interested and passionate and I just loved kind of diving into this new experience. I thought it was very interesting. And you can discover that if you pay close enough attention, the idea of the ego in the sense of you are the author of your own thoughts, you can discover that to be an illusion. And when you have that experience, it's a very liberating experience. And it's not like once you have that you're like that forever. But just the understanding, and at the very basic level, that you are not your thoughts and you're not the author of your thoughts. Something that can be discovered if you pay close enough attention was a liberating realization for me. Now, if there's no ego, there's no place from which to be anxious or nervous about. You're able to perceive all of the stock and market information more clearly. And I think Mark Douglas would call this the zone. 
So after a few months, I was doing this for a while, um, and let's get back into June, because now these things are going side by side. June, I had my first breakthrough. It had been 18 months since I had read the wiki and decided that this could be a potential future, and it had been about one year since I quit my job. The market had a bullish breakout in June of 2023, and with all this tailwind, my hard work was finally able to pay off. I hit a 75% win rate and fell just shy of a 2.0 profit factor. I wasn't profitable, but the pieces were finally starting to fit together. It was very, very nice. But I also knew that just like that just like January 2023, when I got ahead of myself, I wouldn't make the same mistake. I'm just focusing on the process. Now, at the same time of this breakthrough, my dad had implored me to begin a job hunt. So it would take time and take a lot of interviews. And I hope by that time when I got the job or when I got any job that I would hit my trading milestone. So in July, I had kind of an off month. I went on a cruise with my friends, my first real vacation in a long time. <laughs> um, and I enjoyed the trip with my friends, but still couldn't get away from trading. I read AVWAP E by Brian Shannon. And that was probably, again, one of the best books that I read because it dramatically improved my technical knowledge of how markets worked. And in July, I finished with under a 75% win rate and 2.0 profit factor. But unlike February of 2023, when I had I went from a month where I hit the metrics and a month where I failed, in July, I thought, you know, that's okay. I'm just going to get back to it. I made progress because the loss no longer symbolized what it had originally symbolized to me. It didn't symbolize a lack of progress. And I could focus more on, again, what was technically going wrong. I realized that in June and July, I had these swing shorts in a bullish market, and they were costing me my profit factor and win rate. If I looked at my longs only, I easily hit over 85, or sorry, over 74% win rate and 2.0 profit factor. My shorts were costing me heavy. I also knew that at this point, hey, I've never really traded in a bullish market or even bullish conditions. I need to learn how to trade this. So now August came around and I hit an 82% win rate and 3.0 profit factor for 41 trades. Now we hit September, 87% win rate, 6.0 profit factor for 34 trades. I found this sweet spot of trades to take between 30 to 40 trades a month because of the market conditions I was taking mostly day trades. And for the first time in my entire trading career, I'd hit two months in a row for a 75% win rate. I didn't want to get ahead of myself, but I couldn't help but feel hope that finally there was some light appearing at the end of the tunnel. Like I mentioned, the market was bearish at the time. And that was okay with me because I finally had some experience where bearish conditions were like greeting an old friend. It was like riding a bike. I felt so much more comfortable on the short side than the long side at this point. And I know that, you know, even though that bear markets are fairly rare compared to bull markets, that I'll, I feel confident that I'll never truly be uncomfortable shorting because that's where I started my journey. Now we've been in October, last month to go. First two weeks came around and I was on track to hit my target. Then halfway through the month, I actually began my new job. So I got the offer in September and I obviously knew it was going to happen. And I was thinking of how do I construct my day with this new job in mind? And I made so that, hey, I'll put a trade from 6.30 to 9 a.m. Then from my job from 9 to 5, then review my trades and then sleep. I knew that it would take away time, which I didn't really want to give because working a part-time job or even two part-time jobs, I could spend a lot of my time focused on learning how to trade. But I underestimated the impact of dividing my attention from trading to a full-time job. October was not a win. The first half, I hit my target, 75% win rate, 2.2 profit factor for 29 trades. In the second half, I had a 53% win rate, 
and 0.6 profit factor over 23 trades. Why did I lose in the second half? I asked. What caused this? And when I looked at my trades, I saw that dividing my attention caused me to enter trades poorly. When I enter trades poorly, it had a downstream effect on my conviction and my confidence. So this hurt a little bit. I had 2.5 months, but not three. I hit 100 trades for those 2.5 months. And I thought, you know, I technically have it under trades if it's not for three months. But I also knew that I'd scaled up too early in the past and I'd gotten burned. So I would rather take my time and I accepted that I would learn at the pace that I would learn. And I'm going to restart this. I'm going to restart this back from in November. Three months again. There's no shortcuts. There's no hard work. I didn't do it. I got close. I got closer than I've ever been. But I didn't do it. And I knew that I would have to do it. I would have to completely blow through it in order to really feel comfortable eventually scaling up. So, what did I do? I continued to do what I'd done from the past two years. I picked myself off the ground, and I got back in the ring. The light at the end of the tunnel. I restarted my one share challenge in mid-November. I started slowly focusing on the process. I finished the month with a nice start, but nothing to gloat about given my small sample size, 14 trades for a 73% win rate and profit factor of two. December came around and I hit my mark for 30 trades. And then in January, that process repeated again. Just like that, I found myself back at two months in a row, like the start of October. But I had some doubts. Would now be different? Would I still fall into the same trap and same pitfalls that came in in October? These thoughts came into my head, but I pushed them out. I had to focus on my process, which was working. If I got too caught up or too focused on my own stats, I knew I would fail. The difference here in this two-month streak versus the last two-month streak was my making videos. At the end of 2023, I saw that a lot of traders had put out some content. And I felt that there wasn't a huge gap between my ability and theirs but they had managed to put the pieces a lot quicker than I had. I was watching Pete's videos at the time, which had this great format. Look at the pick from the last video, see how you did. Here's your market analysis, here's your stock search, and here's your stock pick. Pete did this every week, but I thought it would be even better for me if I did this every day. So I reviewed my pick from the last video, I gave my market long-term fundamental, my long-term technical, my short-term technical. I looked at the SPY M5 chart. I'll give my opinion on what swing traders and day traders would do. I would give a pick and explain why I liked it. And this wasn't really for anyone to watch or me to teach anyone. It was just for me to put the pieces of the puzzle together. So I started this in January and I put a video nearly every day. And the hope was my trading and my thought process would improve if I made a video like this. At the end of the month, I would also make a monthly trade recap video. So I'd recap all the trades and I would summarize the win and loss for the month. And I would notice any patterns that I could improve. This is pretty similar again to what Pete does with his market picks, except there's not really a lot that he can improve. So with all this background in mind, we're now into February and I had an additional boost of confidence from reviewing my January picks. And this wasn't a confidence that was too low or confidence that was too high but it was a healthy level of confidence because it was backed up by the fact that my video picks were doing very very well i was 16 and 3 in january i trusted my ability and i respected my market and because i had those two things that were driving my decisions i was in the sweet spot of confidence. And at the end of February, I looked at my trades for the past three and a half months, 75% win rate, 2.0 profit factor for over 100 trades. 
I did it. It was weird hitting this goal because this has been my singular focus for two years and I actually did it. I didn't really jump with joy or glee or even like throw myself a party or something. It was just nice. And it was a reminder that these goals are just a moment in this whole journey. And really, the enjoyment of the journey is what's more important. But I did remind myself to be proud of myself. Sometimes I don't give myself credit when I should give myself credit. And I was proud that I had achieved something that I'd set out to do two years ago. I was proud that I took this bet on myself even though I wasn't sure, even though it was against, you know, some values in my family and uh, maybe the thinking of some of my friends, and it paid off. It gave me confidence that my trajectory was in the right place. And with more time and more practice, I could really reach my goal of being financially independent with trading. I knew I was ready to scale up, and I had confidence in my ability to make money, but more importantly, not lose money. Section two describes what I learned. I talk about first, literally what I learned, and then how I learned what I learned. I talk about my current daily process and my attempt to standardize and structure my days. And then I talk about confidence and competence. So let's get into what I learned. Now, the f I'm going to break this into two sections. Again, first, the actual kind of high-level takeaways. I have about, you know, six or seven different takeaways. And then also how I learned the information. So let's talk about the how part because I think that is the more important part of this piece. So when I'm learning something, and this doesn't have to be trading, I'm going to use an example of tennis because I coach tennis. When I'm trying to learn something, I look first for the expert or the gold standard in this area. So if I want to learn how to hit a backhand, I'm going to go to YouTube and I'm going to look at Novak Djokovic backhand slow motion. And I'm going to break that backhand down into its various components and understand what he's doing. Because I know that this is the ideal outcome that he's hitting, right? What is he doing in this backhand that's making it great? And then I try to replicate my backhand to match his. And then I compare and iterate and compare and iterate until I have a great foundation. Now, in tennis, you know, there's different biomechanics. Everyone's backhand is a little bit different. But this is the foundation, technically, for this backhand. It's the same thing in trading. So the best thing about the real day trading subreddit or the one option chat room, both of which I'm in, is that you see the gold standard every day. You see professional traders trade. You see the trades that they take, and you even see the intermediate traders, right, stepping up and seeing the trades that they take. So if you're starting from zero, you not only have pros, but you have other verified traders who have proven to themselves or are proven to others that. They're making good picks and good decisions, and they're not pros, but there's they've made a huge, huge leap in terms of the decision-making process. So you look at them and say, okay, they're the gold standard in this case. What are the components of the trade of the decision-making process? And if you don't know the components, this is where I lean on the, uh, the system in one option. You have the long-term market fundamentals, long-term market technicals, short-term market technicals. You can then zoom into the M5 market and you structure your bias for all of these areas, right? How confident, how bullish or bearish or neutral am I in each of these scenarios? Then you look at the stock picks. You say, okay, what is the D1 stock chart? Why is it good? What is the M5 stock chart? What is it good? Okay, here's my entry. Why am I entering at this time and not another time? What's my trade expectation? What are the different scenarios? When will I add? When will I not add? Why did I exit at this point? Why didn't I exit later? Why should I have exited earlier or should I have held on to longer? Were there anything I missed? So you break it down to all of these components of the trade, right? And look at, I mean, look at Pete's post on Reddit, the anatomy of the trade. 
break the components down and every month you rank those components and you say okay i did all these things today on a scale from one to five with five being a pro and one being an absolute wall street bet idiot <laughs> Uh, I would say no offense, but I do mean the offense there. Where is my weakest point? So an example for me was in in early in the probably the first year of my trading, I was really focused on getting really good D1s, D1 charts. And I was doing that. And I was doing a pretty good job. But maybe between the 12th to 18th month range, I realized that I wasn't really putting the market context into account, right? So if I'm taking a swing, and let's see, if I was only taking overnight swings, I'll be taking overnight swings and the market is pulling back. And my order I said, we could tank and I'd be like, what? Like this setup was so good. Why did it tank? It's because I missed part of the component. And at my, my short-term market read, instead of a five it was like a one it was like a two it was not good <laughs> so you have to evaluate yourself on those components you find the weakest link and you improve that that's why you have the goal standards of the pros you can compare them right component to component see what you did see what they did and understand how you can improve the other part um, that kind of goes along with breaking it down to components is kind of creating templates and rubrics to organize this information. So one thing I did and I created about a year in was something called the daily market template. So every day before I trade, I don't take any single trade until I fill out this template. And what it does is organize my entire market bias. So long-term fundamental, I list out all the reasons why my long-term fundamental uh, so I don't forget them. I list out my long-term technical reasons and why I feel this way. And those sections don't really change, right? Because your longer-term bias will change over the course of like a month, maybe, right? Look at what happened, um, you know, from February to our March bias. In February, we were more bullish. And in March, we were still bullish, but less bullish, right? So there was a change in that bias. So I'll usually update that, you know, in the weekends once a month. But then I'll also have my short-term market bias, and this is something I change every day. So when I write, to me, I need to write information down. So when I write all this information down, I really have my bearings, right? It's not like I'm just buying stock and I'm like, oh, I hope the market does this. It's like, again, running with a chicken with your head cut, running like a chicken, run, not running with a chicken. <laughs> You're running like a chicken with his head cut off. Have your bias, get your bearings, and that will save so much time in the day, right? When you have your bearings, then you can spend more time finding stocks and focusing on entries rather than figuring out what your market bias is. So I'm usually figuring out my market bias, you know, we'll get to this in my routine, but usually earlier in the day while I'm kind of waiting for the first 30 to 60 minutes uh, in the market and seeing, um, you know, how the day may unfold. Um, the second thing I made was a stock selection template. So when I was working on my D1 picks, again, I'd create all the components of a great D1, right? So if I'm going long, it's like, okay, well, I want a stock that's, you know, above its SMAs. I want a stock with nice steady price action um, and, you know, has a technical breakout, heavy volume, maybe above its AVWAP E, not overextend from the 8 EMA, no earnings recent, or, or sorry, no um, uh, earnings coming up very, very soon, no peer earnings coming up very, very soon. Check if it's a newsy stock. Uh, check the sector strength, uh, just check if there's any random news that's maybe driving this that you need to be aware of. So I have my checklist on the D1, and then I have my checklist on the M5, right? I want it to be above the priority high. I want it to be above VWAP. I want the volume to be pretty good, and I want it to have relative strength, obviously relative strength on the D1 as well. So I have my criteria of what that is. And then over time, once I've done that so much, I don't have to actually write my stock selection down because it's become a lot more automatic. So the goal is, at least for me, I'm writing this down over and over and over and over and over again until the process just becomes automatic in my head. So to me, the reason I'm losing on certain trades right now is not because I'm picking bad D1 charts. I'm usually picking very good D1 charts, but there's something else in those components that I'm failing at. So the last thing I did was create a knowledge center. So there's a lot of information in trading, you know this if you read anything in the system, if you read anything in the wiki, um, and even things that are 
in those communities, but not necessarily relevant to our relative strength and relative weakness edge. The best example I can give of that is when Kira in the one option chat was talking about event volatility. Medhat was talking about Gex and Vex, um, you know, liquidity uh, and how, you know, there's an implied order book. Like all of these things is good to know, right? I think you sh the more you understand how the market works, the better um, trader you'll be because you will, you'll understand why moves are happening, right? Who are the players in the game? Now, the main thing I did was really categorize information to good to know context and directly help me into my trading. So to give the same example, understanding event volatility pricing is good to know context because I'm like, all right, well, you know, market makers are pricing in a certain probability distribution on certain events, the biggest thing, which is earnings. And they say there's an expected range. And then that gets baked in into the option volatility pricing, which like the option pricing with regards to that volatility. So that's great, but I'm not a volatility trader, right? So, you know, unless you're doing a strangle, maybe an earnings time spread, it, well, what it really does, it reinforces the fact that I'm not going to buy, I'm not going to buy out of the money calls <laughs> before earnings, um, like I was doing that before, which I was not. Um, but it's not directly helpful to my training because I'm trying to master relative strength for the weakness. Now, if we read a Pete article, and Pete's talking about when to enter and exit the trade based on the whether it's a trend or an LPTE day, uh, or an inside day or an outside day, that is directly relevant to my trading because that will directly help me improve my edge. So it's important to categorize that information like that. Um, and what I've done is I created a knowledge center that just puts in, you know, all the information, like, you know, what's the market, history of the market, general economics, like, you know, everything that I have seen and read and learned about in the chat. Uh, I now I'm actually writing a knowledge center 2.0 where I'm trying to consolidate um, all of that information into a more concise and pointed manner than what I've done in the original knowledge center, which is a little bit like a word vomit. But the point is over here that you want to have these templates and have your information organized so you're able to map how everything relates to each other right there's when you're an expert at something you have a mental map of how everything works so when you encounter new information you're able to uh, plot it on the map that you've already created mentally okay so that's how i learned information i'm going to now talk about the guiding principles the first one is to focus on the process and not the PL. I think a lot of people have talked about this, but from what I view, PL is an output that you don't directly control, right? You can't just say, I'm buying a stock and now my PL is going to go up. Process is the input that, and the output is PL. Process is the input that you directly control. Trading is decision making. And Consistently profitable traders are consistently profitable decision makers. You might have seen, you know, Dave or Pete or Hari say, okay, I lost on this trade, but I would take this setup 10 out of 10 times or 20 out of 10 times or not 20 out of 10, 20 out of 20 times, uh, maybe 20 out of 10 if they're feeling really confident. But the point is that this is the setup that they trade and based on all their analysis, this has a very high win rate, very high profitability too. So if this doesn't work out, this is a fringe case, right? This is the times where you just take the L, you move on, but you see the same pattern, you get in again, because you know statistically and historically that this is a working edge. That is important. That is a huge, huge, huge part of the skill. The second part I'm going to talk to a little bit later in this section, but it's that confidence comes from competence. No one is confident at something that they are bad at. And if they are, then it's a false sense of confidence that could quickly be shattered. <laughs> and they will quickly and quickly find out that they are defied at every corner um, on their confidence. You need to focus on improving your skills and the confidence is going to come. Um, so I'm going to get to that in a later section, but that is a very big principle for me. The third one is to turn weaknesses into strengths. When I was trading in the first year or two, I was very bad at adding to winners because my my mental um, 
my mental bias was to be more risk averse, right? I'm, I was kind of trading scared. I didn't really want to add to winners. And if I got a winner, I've just felt lucky. So what I did was I tried to overcorrect the problem. I said, okay, look, I'm making this mistake and I'm actually going to swing way the other way. I'm going to try to add to every single trade. And it's okay if I make a mistake because this is at least a different kind of mistake. And I've established this huge extreme, right? Where I'm not adding to trades and I'm adding to every single trades. And now adding to every single trades isn't really the right way to trade. But from a mental standpoint, you get that data of, okay, I've added to the trades, you get some data on winners, you get some data on losers, and then you fine tune the process to get to a nice even middle ground. So overcorrecting is very important. And again, I put this in tennis terms because I'm a tennis coach. The best tennis players don't have any tennis weaknesses. And that's because they turn any weaknesses into strengths. So I, I know if you're not a tennis fan, this is going to make no sense, but I'm going to take the example of Yannick Sinner recently. So at the time of recording this video, he just finished the Miami Open, and it's a tournament that he's been runner-up two times, and he finally won it on his third attempt. And he is a player that has been good, but every single year he's been committed to improving something in his game. At first, his sure serve was kind of you know shaky, um, you know, kind of awkward. And now it's become very fluid, very strong, and become a weapon. He didn't have a lot of variety uh, in his game, and he kind of gunned the ball too much. And then he worked on adding the drop shot, adding the slice, coming into serve and volley. So his commitment to improving the game actually had him surpass a lot of players that he was losing on, losing to earlier. And it's the same point in this case. He's turning his weaknesses into strengths. Djokovic is another great example where he was someone who would never slice, never drop shot, and now he has a great slice, great drop shot, great serve and volley. Um, and it just makes him a much more difficult player to face. You want the same thing in trading. You want to have um, no weaknesses in your trading. Find every weaknesses. They are holes in your ship that are sinking it. Plug every single hole in your ship. Okay, guiding principle number four. This is a marathon and not a sprint. Burnout is real for me. Like that has happened to me in this process. Like there are times where it's like, damn, I'm giving it 120% and I've, I've like just been absolutely shit on for two or three straight months and I'm trying new things. Right. And I'm overcorrecting and blah, blah, blah. And it's just like, I'm just, I'm, I'm seeing like, I'm like, all right, I'm, I'm making progress and making different mistakes, but it hasn't quite clicked together. And then it'll finally click together. But I want to bring this up because I think it's okay to take breaks in my opinion like i'm not saying you shouldn't work hard right i think trading is something like any thing that you want to be a professional at you need to work hard you need to give it time but i think it's also fair to say that burnout is a symptom of working too hard right i think it's important to have at least one thing that you do or like outside of trading that gives you a little bit of balance right so for me it's like i love coaching tennis i love you know hanging out with my friends and i think having that time in the week you know once a week twice a week just spending some time doing those things i come back to trading being like okay i have some break i'm really ready to tackle this to you know give it my full effort um because i just need a little bit of time away so you know everyone can have there's there's different levels to this, right? And look, some people are like, hey, I can trade, you know, and learn 16 hours a day and do that for two years. So if that's you, kudos to you. That's not me. <laughs> I, I, need, I need to have at least one or two other things. Uh, the other thing is you're going to have responsibilities too, right? Like a lot of people are not just trading and only learning how to trade. That's a luxury that very few can afford. I mean, you have jobs, you have families, you have other responsibilities. Um, and you know, sometimes they're just going to take priority in your life, right? Like if you have a family emergency, that's going to have to supersede you're trading, you know, that's just, it's, that's what comes first. And you have to accept that and know that, you know, you'll take a short term pause and you'll come back and you'll pick back where you left off. Right. And, and you try to do what you can. If you're truly passionate, you'll still find ways to try to improve your trading, right? Maybe you're not able to trade every single day. Maybe you review charts. Maybe you mark trades where you would have taken them. Um, maybe at least try to swing trade or work on something else. You still find creative ways to learn even when other things are taking priority in your life. The next one is less is more. This is one that I kind of discovered early on, but it wasn't cemented in me 
it took a couple of months to be cemented in how I think. The real reason, personally, I came across this was what I talked about in the previous section. If you remember my trading in October, you know, I was taking like a hundred trades in the month and all of that, like, you know, half of them were just complete shit. And then 30, maybe the other 30% were like, okay. And actually only 20% was good. And the main idea here is that you're not trading to trade. You're trading to make money. You can make money by not having a shit ton of trades. That is a huge, huge, huge realization on the path to becoming more profitable. Like if you, and that's why it's important. And that was a journey takes a while because you have to see that, okay, I traded like a hundred trades in October and I lost money and a 50% win rate. I took 20 trades in November. I'd won way more money with way less trades and way less work and more confidence in my picks. That is huge. You have maximum confidence in your picks and you look like, imagine you get like one to three excellent trades each day, right? That's like, you know, you can make a great living off of that. That's what I believe, you know, in, in, in my opinion, I think you can make a great living off of that. And as you get better, you're going to add more and more tools to that kit. But in terms of a foundation, right? Just a few great picks every day is all you need. One great exercise I gave myself was to give my, to, to only have one bullet. I could only make one trade a day and, and it forced me to find the absolute best pick. And sometimes I'd be stuck between two great picks and really say, okay, why do I like this other pick more than the other one? Right? Maybe both of them are great D1 charts, both of the SMAs, both above high volume. Maybe the difference is, you know, one is close to the eight EMA and the other isn't right. Or maybe the other one is like slightly choppier than the other stock. When you have one bullet, one, you cut out all your mistakes, right? As a beginner, you're making a ton of mistakes. That's costing you winners. In my opinion, I feel you should cut your mistakes first, and then you can focus on really improving your winners. Okay, next one over here. Get a routine for the non-trading parts of your life. Trading is a performance passion, and I like really like to compare it to a sport. If you look at pro athletes and the best of the best, Right, I mean, some of them have talent and they're just doing shit stuff, but a lot of them and the really great ones, if you look at like LeBron, right, he's got a very solid routine. He takes care of his body. He takes care of his health. He's focused and locked in when he needs to be. High quality sleep, exercise, good diet, you know, and taking some small breaks throughout the trading session. You don't need to watch every single M5 bar on Spy Farm. Um, and again, having something, you know, outside of trading that you do in maybe like, you know, once a week or something, right? Something a little bit different. But when you establish that consistency, you reduce all of these performance um, noise and flaws that can happen. The biggest thing I noticed for me was sleep. If I get terrible sleep, I cannot operate at my best for trading because I'm mentally compromised and I'm emotionally compromised. So having consistent high quality sleep is insanely important. So I'm not going to talk about like all of these methods to do high quality sleep and, and eating and exercising. So if you're interested, I would recommend go check out, um, you know, experts in this field. Like I recommend, um, you know, like Matthew Walker is a big sleep expert. Um, I recommend the blueprint diet and look at Brian Johnson's actions over there. Um, he kind of has put all of this together in a system that that's data backed and is very, very powerful. And I take a lot of um, inspiration from what he does. So, but take care of yourself, get a good routine, right? If you, a healthy body and a, a well-rested body is what you need to optimally perform every single day. Okay. Last one over here is cross training mindset problems. So first part is with mindset, I do believe that you have to be competent. But it's also important to know what is your own personal biases, right? Some people are more risk-loving, some people are more risk-reverse, uh, and they both may have the same foundation, but they may approach the trading in a different way. So I, in my case, learning how to trade shined a light on my mindset issues. Because I was anxious and risk-averse in real life, 
I was anxious and risk averse in trading, right? It's not going to change. It, if anything, it actually just exposes it to the light, right? It's it's basically opening, you know, the doors, it's you know, looking under the bed, seeing all the monsters under the bed and just having me confront it. So, here's the two things I did. One is understanding really what is the problem, right? And I don't I want to say problem lightly because like, you know, to view it as a problem is maybe not the most helpful lens, but it's just understanding what is who you are at your core. So, I liked, I did a lot of deep diving, you know, I did journaling, I did voice memos, um, you know, I, I did, I even did therapy for a while just to see, Hey, would that help? Right. Just to understand myself. When you understand the core problem, you realize that who you are as a person pervades every facet of your life. Me being risk averse as a person was me being risk averse as a trader was me being risk averse as a friend, as a social person, and even as a tennis player. So at first you might think, okay, well, that's a, you know, that kind of sucks, right? Like this problem is affecting everything. But if you flip it, you realize that this is a bi-directional street, right? It's a two-way street. So if I can change who I am through trading or tennis or any out sort of output, then that will affect the other outputs. So let me give an example, right? If I am a socially anxious person, right? I'm not really someone who's going to talk to strangers because I'm risk averse, right? It's talking to strangers is too much risk for me. So if I put myself out there where I'm talking to strangers, I'm taking on risks and I'm getting data and I'm getting confident, that's going to translate over to my trading because it's changing my perception of who I am. So the core that's affecting my trading is different because I am casting a vote for the person that I want to be. And that's something I'm taking from Atomic Habits. I can cast votes in different areas and they can have this crossover effect into trading. It's also important because it shows that your identity is mutable and you it's within your power to change, right? You didn't choose who you are really as a person, but it does matter that you change them and it's also amazing to see that you can change them. So those are kind of the main guiding principles and, and kind of what I learned from my journey over here. Uh, some of the books I found the most helpful for my trading, one is AVWAP by Brian Shannon. Uh, two was The Mental Game of Trading by Jared Tendler. Three, Thinking in Bets by Annie Duke. And four, Atomic Habits by James Clear. Um, and again, I think the wiki and, and the system and one option supersede those, but this is just sort of external um, reading that I thought was the most helpful. I've read more books than this, but to me, these are the ones that I could actually implement and have a lasting impact on my trading. Okay, section 2B is my current daily routine. So this is something that, you know, changes over time, but um, I just wanted to kind of lay out how my routine is. Everyone's going to be different. Um, but if you're like, Hey, I don't know what to do. I just hope this gives you some ideas. So I'm on the West coast market opens for me at six 30. So, um, I try to wake up between five 45 and six. Um, I'll just kind of, you know, like brush my teeth and stuff like that. Uh, and then I want to work out, um, for, you know, 20, 30 minutes and be done by six 30. So I finish my workout at six 30. So, um, it's a mix of running, stretching, a little bit of resistance training, uh, I'll top in the shower and then. I'm on my computer by 6.45. And I'm okay with missing the first 15 minutes of the market. The only thing that really happens is um, if I have set profit targets, they get hit. And, you know, I'm ready. I'm, I'm, I'm ready to go. I feel way better after I exercise. When I get to do my trading, I feel more focused. I feel alert. I've accomplished something hard. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of evidence to show that uh, exercise and your mental performance are inextricably linked. So I you know, recommend that. So I'll do my daily market template, you know, I'll scan for stocks, I'll look for picks, and this is where my, my day trading takes place. I'll also evaluate, you know, my open position, see how they're doing, see if I have to make any adjustments to my thesis. Um, and then around this time, I'll record my daily video. So I try to do a video every single day where I give my market opinion and I give a stock pick. 
then uh, around 9 a.m. I'll get ready, I'll open my laptop for work, and I may have meetings and stuff like that throughout the day, but I really try to dedicate those first two and a half hours of the day just to trading and focusing on improving my craft. So if it's a lighter morning at work, then, you know, I'll, I'll focus my time on trading and really just try to set alerts, uh, you know, see if there's any day trades, monitor positions. So if it's a busy morning, um, I'll just have alerts open on my positions and I'm going to focus on work. Um, in terms of eating, um, I, I have my coffee, like, you know, only in, I wait 90 minutes after I wake up to have my coffee. So it don't, doesn't interfere, um, you know, kind of with any of my circadian patterns. Uh, I also don't make sure I have any coffee, you know, afternoon. So I have kind of a window of coffee kind of between like set between seven 30 to 12 is when I have my coffee. So, um, I have that, I have like my, my supplements, I'll have, uh, my meals. Uh, I, I, in a pretty close eating window from maybe eight or nine to two to three. So I eat early in the day and I, and I cut eating out later, uh, it's because it's better for my sleep. Uh, my diet is pretty healthy. Um, a lot of nuts, some fruits, uh, veggies, salads, uh, and then some lean meat, like I'll have a turkey burger or some chicken. Um, and, uh, my supplements, I'll have a lot of, uh, extra virgin olive oil. And, um, again, all my eating, it'll be done by three. So after the market closes, I'm going to upload my trades. Uh, I'm just going to, you know, write some thoughts down uh, in my journal, try to evaluate some picks. And then for the rest of the day, I'll focus on my actual work. So any meetings or, you know, like I'm doing you know, financial stuff. So looking at like statements and projects and cash flow and EBITDA and all that kind of stuff. So doing all my work, um, until five, and then I'll take a little break. Um, if I have a tennis lesson on those days, I'll teach my tennis lessons, which is nice. Um, and those are usually Tuesday and Thursday. If it's a Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I'm going to use that extra time for some trading work, but I'll definitely take a break between my actual work. I'll take a walk or just meditate or something. Um, and then get into my trading work. And my trading work is pretty light. I stop all work by 8 p.m. No work after 8 p.m. Because I need to wind down my body. I need a good wind down routine to prepare my body to go to sleep. So 8 p.m. cut off all work. You know, I'll, I'll try to, like, I usually read a book. Um, I'll, I'll talk to my girlfriend. Um, I'll just relax in bed. And then I, my goal is to fall asleep by 9 to 9.30. And really success for today starts the prior night. So I need to have a consistent bedtime each night and get my full eight hours of sleep, high quality sleep. Um, so I'm ready to go the next day. I think that's the most important thing because if I have great sleep, everything in my day becomes so much easier. If I have a terrible night of sleep, I just hate my life. Like I do, I do not want to do anything. It's just really trying to survive and get past the day. So that's my routine. And like, you know, it sounds like, um, uh, like, honestly, I wish I could really be perfect at this every day, but I'm not perfect at this, right? Like some days I do a really good job. Other days I don't do a great job. Um, it's just like trading, but, um, you know, I'm trying to get better at my routine every single day. Um, you know, refine my craft, create something structured and really, really try to tailor my life. So it prioritizes my health, prioritizes my trading first, and then manages the other things in my life. The last part of the section is about confidence. Confidence is currency. If you read the wiki, you know how much we talk about mindset. And in the beginning of this video, I discussed a situation that got me here in the first place. The reason I didn't want to just start with, hey, I made it and how I learned is because I wanted to include the context that got me here. Right? I think everyone comes into trading at different points in their life with different advantages and disadvantages. So knowing that context, I think, helps you understand, hopefully, why I struggled the way I did. My mindset problem was that I didn't have confidence. And after some trading, I'd gained this false Dunning-Kruger confidence. I'd have a hot month, maybe some market conditions lined up. And the next month I would tank and the next month I'd come up and the next month I would tank and then I would tank for a few months and then maybe I'd get it. A lot of ups and downs, a lot of roller coasters. And if you saw, and not if you saw, but as we saw in the ups and downs chapter, 
I did a lot of things to understand myself emotionally, right? I I read a lot of books. I journaled. You know, I kept an emotional log of how I was feeling every 30 minutes. And all of those were helpful in terms of building awareness emotionally, and it truly translated to every aspect of my life. So I'm not to say that it wasn't helpful, but the real problem was that I just wasn't good at trading. I wasn't confident because I wasn't good. And in hindsight, it was just so obvious. Like if you aren't a professional golfer, of course, you're not going to feel confident about getting par in the 17th hole, right? Because you're not good. If you're a professional and you have played this court a whole bunch of times, know all the ins and outs, you've done this again a billion times, right? You know that you're good at this and that you can make it. And that gives you confidence. Now, some people are overconfident, right? And they just naturally are. And this may give them an edge in certain areas. Um, and I think it could give them an edge in trading as well. But if you're overconfident and have a lot of money, I think it can be really brutal and you can take some hard losses. Um, so if you're overconfident, you're trading with one share, that's fine. But, you know, that's that's just kind of what I've seen. So as a nervous and risk-averse person, I had to build my confidence from stats, which meant gaining consistency, right? If I hit a 75% win rate and 2.0 profit factor for three months in a row, I know that my performance cannot be a fluke. So then how did I build consistency? It's by working on my skills. It's everything I mentioned in the previous part of this section, right? How I learned things. I had I was focused on improving my decision making process, identifying the weaknesses and correcting them. And it, that just takes time. You have to filter out the luck from the skill in your traders. So again, right? I made a rubric. I graded myself on the skills each month: the long-term market fundamentals, long-term market technicals, short-term market technicals, intraday spy price action, picking good stock charts on the D1, picking good M5 charts, good trade entries, having good trade management exiting the trade, and then evaluating that entire process. So for me, I wrote down a concrete plan for every single trade. I said, okay, here's what I want the stock to do. Here's what I want the market to do. I detailed out every single trade. I detailed out all my support and resistances, and I noted exactly where I would take profits. I marked ideal entry points in the market every day and on the stock every day when I was doing bad and reviewing my day trades. I looked at all my day trades and said, okay, like, why am I making mistakes here? What are some common themes? What am I missing in my analysis? I analyzed my strategies and saw what I can improve. And then I had something to work off of for the next month. I'm making incremental progress. When I got more and more of the pieces correct, my consistency increased and my confidence increased. The final part about this is sharing your opinion with others. In January of 2024, I was maybe halfway through my one share challenge. I was feeling pretty good. And I saw a lot of intermediate traders putting out content. They had the confidence to teach others because they were confident in their skills. He put out a video every week talking about his market opinion. He gave his stock picks and he's been doing this for, you know, years, right? In more than a decade. So I thought, what if I put out content every single day and then tracked it? It's the same idea of having this goal standard for improvement, right? Pete can put out a video and he can give a pick and he's confident in the pick because he is a professional trader. He's done this a bajillion times. I knew that writing out my thoughts was helpful. And I knew that verbalizing my thoughts was more helpful. And then I knew that verbalizing my thoughts to an audience would be the most helpful because even if no one watches my videos, like I don't care if people watch videos or not, maybe some people will. But me sharing my opinion to others is against the original risk averse version of myself. He would not be doing that. I also wanted a systematic approach to give out picks and also look at those picks every single month and see were the picks were the picks I was giving good. And even if I didn't trade personally or if I gave a pick, did that pick make sense? 
Why did I recommend this pick? That process forced me to, again, refine my approach and it puts it under scrutiny. And if something survives scrutiny, you become so much more confident in it. So for January and February, I did that. I put a video every day and my confidence shot up. I gave one pick every day, 39 trades, and I had 35 wins and five losses. We had a great market. I'm not saying that, you know, the market was super hard, blah, blah, blah. Like it was an incredibly strong bull market. And there's no reason for me to take that away from myself. Just because the market was very strongly bullish, you could argue it's easier than other markets. It doesn't take away from the fact that I gave great picks. It showed me that I was able to put all the information together to be profitable and vet that to an audience. Confidence is everything. And when things go wrong, right, it's not the losses. The losses can hurt, but it's also the lack of confidence that will my ability still be there tomorrow? That is, I think, probably one of the most difficult parts of trading, I would imagine. Now, there needs to be a healthy level of confidence as well. In January 2023, after some months of struggle, I hit my first month above a 75% win rate and profit factor of two. And I remember really getting ahead of myself. I was trying to tell myself, hey, keep calm. You know, it's only one month. Don't get over ahead of yourself. But I was like, hey, man, two more months and then I'm going to size up. And here's how I'm going to size up. And then I'm going to leave my job. And here's how much money we're going to make. And then after three years, I'm going to be like this. After just one month, it was getting way over my head. And I was getting overconfident. And then I got burned the next month. So there is kind of a healthy level of confidence you want to have, right? And it all comes down again to your competence. How well can you put all the pieces together to make profitable trades day in and day out, regardless of the market conditions? You have to test yourself every single day. What are your picks? Why do you believe what you believe? What's changed? What's your market read? Everything. So build your confidence. And that's what takes a lot of time. Section three, the future. In the first part of this, I'm going to talk about why I feel confident scaling up. In the second part, I'm going to talk about the next levels that I see in the short term and the long term. And then the final section, I'm going to talk about when will I take the final leap. So, first section. Why do I feel confident scaling up? There's a quote from Pete and Hari. I want to say it's in maybe the summer of 2023. Not quite sure. But here's what he said. When you're ready to size up, you will know. If there's any ounce of fear, doubt, or uncertainty, it will rear its ugly head when you oversize. So when I first read this, I was like a year in, all sorts of emotions swirling in my head. Didn't really get it. Like I read it and it made sense, but I didn't understand it experientially. Now I know what they mean. After hitting a standard of consistency and profitability for three straight months, when I had scaled up from trading shares to one contract deep in the money, there was not really any fear. There was a little bit of hesitation, right? Because I knew that, hey, I'll make more money on the moves up. I'm going to lose more money on the moves down. So you'll, you'll, you know that, hey, this is going to be, there is still a mini leap to be taken. But you also know that your skills are good. And Ultimately, this is a scalable process. Once you've proven this with one share, you can scale up to a larger size. 
you have confidence in your picks, and you've seen a whole bunch of scenarios that your positions can take. You know what to do in these scenarios. So it's really about gathering evidence to back up your claim to scale up. So what are my evidence, right? Why, sh why should I scale up? Why do I deserve to put in more money to the market? So number one, I've had a 75% win rate and 2.0 profit factor for three straight months over 100 trades in bullish conditions. So this is from mid-November to the end of February. I used several strategies. I used short-term swings. I used a few put credit spreads. I did some day trades. And that's how I got to it. Evidence number two. I've had a 75% win rate over and over 2.0 profit factor for two and a half months in bearish conditions over 100 trades. This is August 2022, or sorry, August of 23 to mid October 2023. I've had a 75% win rate and 1.05 profit factor in May of 2023, which is horizontal market conditions. This is over 20 trades. So the caveat for three is that, hey, one, this is a small sample size, so not as relative, not as uh, indicative as the first two pieces of evidence. Two is I was a, this was the worst point in my trading relative to the other two pieces of evidence and who I am today. Three, I was only day trading. So what does this tell me? This tells me that I can be consistently profitable in bullish conditions. I can be consistently profitable in bearish conditions. And I won't lose money in horizontal conditions. And I would bet that, hey, even if we have a horizontal flat market, I know that I won't lose money. That is so important, right? The confidence that I'll do my best and I won't lose money. That's huge. It's absolutely massive. So there's a fourth piece of evidence in here, which is experiencing different markets and different market transitions. So because I learned how to trade in 2022, I saw the transition from a bull market to a horizontal market, which was early 2022, then a horizontal market to a bear market, which was more Q2 of 2022, trading in the bear market, learning, you know, and respecting the market in that case, understanding how it's different from a bull market learning to favor the short side, right? Um, learning how they move, the, the the violent nature of the moves, the long compressions, the dead days in the market, the news-driven aspect of it, all of those things. Um, then I've also traded some um, bearish to horizontal conditions, which is that early to mid-2023, where the market's really dead, we're at this waiting period, and... It's just like a Chinese, you know, water torch. You're just, just dripping, 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 dripping. You don't, you're trying to not bleed any money. Then I've also traded a horizontal to bull market. And that was in the mid to late 2023, right? We had that pullback from August to October. And then we had that nice rally. We also had that nice bullish price action in June where we broke out of that range and we started to get more bullish. So that was also one of the transitions that happened. So all of this gives me pretty much a lot of confidence because if I had, if I started trading now and I'd never seen those bearish conditions, I think I would have a false sense of confidence. Like I would not exactly know what to do because I learned in those conditions. It really feels like when those happen again, whenever that may be in the future, It'll be like riding a bike. And I still, I don't think I'll ever not feel comfortable shorting anymore because I learned how to short. And for so long, I was so much more comfortable shorting and taking the bearish side than even taking the long side. It took a huge mental adjustment. And I never traded a bull market before, uh, really until the past like six months, right? Never really traded that. So I'm really glad I have this experience in a less common market because it you it makes you a better trader. You have more of a more of a higher variety of experience, higher variety of data that you can draw from. So the true test, I think, in scaling up is starting slowly 
Yeah, I think managing your risk and managing your emotional risk. So I like to call this your emotional bench press. If you go to the gym, there's a good chance that you can't just run to the bench press and bench shoot 25. Like maybe if you're just a crazy you know, NFL athlete, but they're going to bench press anyways, right? So it defeats the point. You have to work at getting to 225. And I think scaling up is the same way. So when you start, start trading, you know, you're trading one share, you're just benching the bar. You're trying to get good form, making sure you don't fuck up your shoulders. And, you know, you're breathing properly, your muscles are engaged, everything like that. Now, when you get one share, maybe scale up a little bit. So maybe you toss in some 25s, you're feeling pretty good. You know, your, your form is good. Your form still holds up, right? Everything holds up as you had in the 25. And you, you slowly add. So maybe in a, in a couple of months, you add another 10. And then now you finally get to 135. You got, you got two wheels on there. You got two big plates. You're feeling pretty good. You hit the first milestone, right? And maybe for in trading terms, you're like, hey, I can trade, you know, one contract options, deep in the money options pretty well. One contract debit spreads, foot credit spreads, so on. Then you continue to go, continue to level up your bench press. And it takes time, it takes hard work, but then slowly you get to 225 and you make it. And now you're trading, you know, 10 lots, right? You're trading, trading good size, you're making good money. And you didn't, you can't, you didn't just jump into trading from one share to 10 lots. Most people can't do that. Just like most people can't jump in the gym and bench press 225. It takes time and it takes dedication. So all of this thinking tells me that, hey, I'm in no rush to size up. I'm going to take my time. I'm going to make sure I do it slowly at every level. And I'm going to take these little mini leaps of faith, right? Every time I move up, it's a little mini leap of faith. And by the time, you know, one day, maybe I'll be trading, you know, 10 contracts or 15 contracts, maybe depends on the stock, right? One day I'll get there and I'll say, hey, this was a gradual road. I, and I, and I, by the time I get to this point, it is earned and I trust the position and I'm not thinking about my position size. I'm not thinking about my PL. It's just an extension and a sizing and scaling up of the core strategy that I had mastered all those years when I got my form down benching the bar. Second part of the section is levels and trajectory. So obviously, just because I've hit a one share benchmark and it took me two years, it doesn't mean I'm a pro. If climbing a pro, well, it's not climbing a pro. <laughs> if becoming a pro, I just I just gave away my own example. If becoming a pro is like climbing Mount Everest, then all I've done is acclimatized at base level. To be a pro, it means I can consistently provide myself an income each month without relying on external income regardless of the market conditions. That last part to me is the most important part. The market conditions will always change. What works in one condition won't work in other conditions. That's why you need to have experience to a lot of different conditions. And you need to have a lot of different tools under your belt. I like to think of trading like a business. So if I'm a business, right? I make my money from trading. Each strategy is like a different product. So in different seasons, different products do to perform in you know better or worse, right? So in a bullish market, you know I can take put credit spreads. I can take deep in the money calls. I can still do day trades, but they're not going to be as good. I can do call debit spreads, um, you know, but I don't want to be shorting, swing shorting that many stocks, right? That's not going to be as profitable as a strategy. So I need to have those tools under my belt and they are going to work pretty well in a bullish market. But what if you have a horizontal market? Well, you know, I don't want to take these long, um, long-term swings because it's horizontal. So if we get a breakdown in the other direction, you know, I might just be, um, you know, taking a huge loss and having to uh, take the L's on really big positions. I don't want to do that. I'm going to have a more balanced portfolio. I need to be able to sell premium because stocks may break out and then they have no market tailwind, so they're not going to move. So I'd rather be selling premium and getting money through there because we have no market tailwind. If we have a bear market, there's a lot of volatility and I can't really sell put credit spreads because the risk is too great. The conditions are against our strategy. So I need to be able to day trade, need to be able to do short-term swings, maybe some call debit spreads, some put debit spreads. 
maybe even some call credit spreads. So all of this is saying that I need to have different strategies that I can get to 75% win rate and execute seamlessly regarding, regardless of the market condition, or actually not regardless of the market condition, but tailored to the market condition is the right word for it. So I took a look at my one share journey and most of my wins were short-term swings that lasted, you know, one, two, three, or four days. Um, and a few were put credit spreads. So those were my best strategies. And those are the strategies that I chose to scale up on because I know that those have worked the best. But there's a lot of other strategies I can learn. There is day trading. There's weekly at the monies. My put credit spreads could also um, use some more trades under my belt, right? I'm not able to take as many of those trades than I can with my uh, short-term swings. So put credit spreads, weekly at the monies, day trading stock was decent, but it could be better. Strangles, my earnings time spreads were okay, but you know, there's some consensus that they may not haven't been as good recently as they have been in the past. Um, so there's a lot of different strategies and what I'm thinking is, okay, I'm good at short-term swinging and I'm pretty decent at put credit spreads. What's the other strategy? What's the next best strategy that would make me a versatile trader? And so when I looked at that, I ranked them in this order. First is day trading. Second is uh, debit spreads. And third are long-term swings. And how I landed on this is I ranked all of the different trades based on market conditions. So I said, okay, bear market, horizontal market, bull market, what are the best strategies? What are okay strategies? And what are the worst strategies? And day trading and call debit spreads were either the best strategies or okay strategies in every single market condition because your trade duration is a lot shorter. If you're in volatile chop, you want to be able to have you know debit spreads where you're not having to pay in stream premium for IVs. You also want to get in stock, right? Be able to trade in stock where you have a lot of liquidity, get in, get out, and you don't have to take and worry about overnight risk. So if I only if I only knew how to swing trade and I got into a bear market and it's too volatile to swing trade, I'm not making any money, right? It's like I'm not losing any money, but and that's still good. But if you want to be a professional trader, you got to be able to make money. <laughs> you got to see what the the conditions are like and how can you exploit them based on the right strategy. So that all drove into the goals that I had for this year. So goal number one is learn and implement the other strategies. So get to a 75% win rate and 2.0 profit factor only by day trading. 75% win rate, 2.0 profit factor, only call debits or not call debit spreads, only debit spreads. 75% win rate, 2.0 profit factor, only long swings. And uh, same thing with put credit spreads. And I want 100 trades for each. That's my criteria. 100 trades for each. I know if I can do that, I'm going to feel really confident going into 2025, because now I got a lot of things that I can do every single day. I'm going to feel really good. So I need to be great and hit these same benchmarks for every strategy that I do for relative strength, wealth of weakness, right? And I'm saying, look, for earnings time spread, it might be a little bit different. If you're doing lottos, it could be some different criteria, right? Different, um, you know, win rate and profitability criteria. Um, even if you're, you know, trying to learn how to trade ES and all those are going to come later, but this year I need to master all these other relative strength and relative weakness strategies. Um, weekly at the monies are really good. I think they work in horizontal markets and bull markets. Um, but to me, I think the other strategies supersede them in my opinion. Um, there's also, you know, selling puts. I think that is going to be an important strategy for horizontal markets and also maybe, um, not insanely go, go, go bullish markets, but bullish markets that have more of a stair step orderly dip pattern. So selling puts is also something I'm going to practice and at least practice doing that on paper, um, because there's, you know, option level access and things like that in terms of doing those strategies. So that's goal number one. Goal number two is to grow my account from 25 K to 50 K. So 
from starting this challenge, um, the account has grown from 25K to 29K. So, and, and that's a lot of it's not from doing, you know, most of that wins are, you know, one share or, or things like that. So the goal is to grow my account and prove to myself that I can consistently make money. That's going to take some time. The good thing is goal number one, implementing other strategies is going to pay off for goal number two later down the road. And I like to think of this learning as R&D, if I put this business term and analogy back into play. My short-term swings is my main product. That's my main way of making an income. But credit spreads are a decent product, right? They're doing pretty well, but they could use some product improvement. You know, they're, they're, they're still a little bit rough around the edges. Day trading is in R&D right now. There's potential for it to be successful, but I got to spend some money in R&D to work on that day trading and then implement it into a product launch. Same idea, right? This is a business. What other strategies and products can you bring to make a profitable product mix? So that's the second goal. The third goal is to make a video every single market day with a pick. This is important to me because I want to practice giving my opinion. Making a video each day is a test of everything that I learned. I think the best way to see if you know something is to teach it to someone else. Now, I'm not good enough to be a teacher yet, but I know I'm not a complete idiot and I know I'm, I'm getting better and I'm doing something right. And I do believe I'm good enough to provide my market opinion and my stock pick each day. And I'm going to let my picks do the talking. If my picks are good, then those are my, then, you know, you know that my opinion has some merit. If my picks are shit, then don't listen to my opinion because clearly I don't know what I'm talking about. So you have to go off your picks and going through this process every single day, reviewing all my picks every single month. It gives me confidence and it humbles me. It gets me at the right strike zone of confidence. So those are my three goals for 2024. Now I have longer term goals, right? And I think it's important to have a vague idea of your longer term goals, but you want to have some plan that's more clearly defined in the short term and more loosely defined in the long term because you're not exactly sure what's going to happen. So again, the ultimate goal for me is to be able to do this full time for a living as my sole source of income, but it's going to take some time for me to reach there. And I think it's still, in my opinion, another three years out. The big picture. At this point, I've put in countless hours into trading. For most of my time, I had nothing to show for it. Now I do. But I still have lots of work to do. And because this journey is so long, I often have to remind myself of the big picture. Why am I even doing all this? Is all of this worth it? Why am I putting myself through this journey of adversity? The first and most obvious answer is money, right? You hear them say all the time, we're not trading to trade, we're trading to make money. And some quick, rough, back of the envelope calculations said, hey, your ROI in five years or even 10 years, definitely 10 years, but even five years is higher with trading than sticking with a nine to five job. Nine to five can grow linearly, trading can grow exponentially after you master one share. The second is also a practical answer, which is job security. The implied social contract of a job is you get a consistent paycheck, but you have the risk of being fired at any time. Now this is going to go into my personal beliefs, not only about the job world, but also about AI. With the emergence of AI, this likelihood increases. If you think about a job as essentially a group of tasks that you do, with the AI today, they already subset some of those tasks. The only other assumption you have to make is that they will improve exponentially each year, which we're already seeing. If you look at, you know, from GPT 3.5 to Claude 3 Opus right now by Anthropic, 
impressive, impressive transformation. There's quite an arms race happening right now. When an AI can do a job better, faster, cheaper, and safer than me, why would any company have me instead of the AI? Now, as a trader, I work for myself. So as a trader, I have to decide to fire myself. And the nature of our edge, which is relative strength and relative weakness, hinges on the institution. So as long as institutions make money in the market, we will also make money in the market. The third answer is more important than the first two. Trading and getting better at trading make me happy. While I was doing one share, it did a good job of cutting my losses as I learned the process. But it also instilled a love for the process. Because there's no money involved, I started to reward myself on getting a great setup or getting a great entry or even taking a great exit. I liked finding great picks each day. I liked watching videos and reading articles and reviewing trades and seeing where I can improve. I didn't make any money for two years. So why would I do this if I wasn't making any money now? If your only passion in trading is making the money, you're not going to get to this one share mark. You're not going to be willing to put in the time to make no money, to finally come out on the other side and start making a little bit of money. So when I do finally become financially dependent, I will still trade to trade. I will still trade because I like trading. The goal of trading is to make money, but you also have to love the process of making that money, not just the output of that process. I think it's a bit paradoxical, and it took me some time to fully wrap my head around this idea. But I often, again, compare it to sports where if you look at NBA teams, for example, and great teams are committed to the process. If you look at the Denver Nuggets, for example, when they win the championship run last year, they're committed to the process of improving every single day, of executing every single day, and then they rewarded themselves with the championship. They, they enjoyed that time, but they also loved the process that got them there. That's what's important. And the other part of this third answer is that I want to be really good at something. And I've never been excellent at some something in my life. Now, I've been, I've been good at a few things. I've been okay at a lot of things. But I've never been excellent at one thing. And because we only have a limited amount of time, it's really hard to be excellent in more than one thing. It takes so much time and dedication and part of the journey is saying no to things that you do want to do, not just things that you don't want to do. I could have chosen a lot of things. You know, I could have focused more on tennis. Maybe if I really liked my job, I could have focused on learning more about my job. But I chose trading because one, obviously, you know, you're going to make money. Uh, and why not excel at something that makes you a lot of money? Uh, but two, because it's hard. And it forces me to improve myself and search deep within to master something that is very difficult. I think the privilege of doing something you love every single day has to be earned. It's not an easy path, but that's really why I'm putting myself through this whole journey. This is worth saying no to all the other paths I could have taken or any implicit path laid out before me by my family. I mean, it was worth that cool summer night in July and the emotional ups and downs that followed. There's also a fourth motivation that I didn't initially consider. And it developed maybe halfway through the one chair journey, about a year in. And the motivation was to help other people. I might have got this from my coaching, 
I'm not very sure. But when I'm good at something, I like to teach others and help them because that is a higher value for me than executing myself. The idea of helping others with my skill is something that brings me a lot of happiness and satisfaction. Professional traders mostly keep to themselves, as you guys know, and a lot of them don't give a shit about helping others. You can't really blame them because this is such a hard journey, and they may not be trading our edge. Their edge may be only for their eyes only. New questions are going to, new, not new questions, new traders are going to come in. They're going to question everything. They're going to get nowhere. They're going to leave. They're going to dispute the validity of your system that you've developed over years and you make money out of it every single month. Only a few are really going to pass through this trial. The fact that we have professional traders that post their picks in real time is a blessing. It's this remarkable feat of transparency and it reveals their commitment to changing the perception of this profession. Most people think, wouldn't think, that you can make the world a better place by being a trader. Because you're just making money for yourself, right? How could you make the better place by trading? You're not making any product, not doing anything else. But after coming to the real day trading community and the one option community, I would argue otherwise. These groups have laid out the tools for success for anyone willing to put in the hard work. There is this path to financial independence that is earned. It's not given, it's earned, and it's not sugarcoated. And I feel a great sense of indebtedness to these communities because I'm learning a skill that will forever transform the trajectory of my life. After graduate college, a good chunk of your conscious experience, let's say half of your conscious experience, maybe 40%, is going to be at a job if you're working 9 to 5, maybe more. Half of your working life, if you think about this traditional, you know, 22 to 65, those 43 years, 8 hours a day, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 8 hours of sleeping, you eat, you know, maybe take a walk, see your kids. Most of your time is going to be at a job. I am learning a job that I'm going to love and that will give me the time and flexibility to do other things in my life. Something that I will not get in a traditional nine to five job. So when I started this journey midway through, I said, if I ever make it, if I ever trade for a living, I want to give back to this community. And if I reach certain milestones, I want to give back. This whole video is the first step of that gifting. I'm always, and I said this in the very beginning of the video, I'm always hesitant because I don't want to give advice and come across as an expert when I'm not. I'm just not an idiot. <laughs> That's what I can confidently assert is now I know that I have good picks. I can read the market well, but I am no position to be an expert. So again, I hope this video is an important insight to the entire experience of trading I wanted to give as much detail as possible about my personal journey because no one is coming into trading as a blank slate. We all bring stuff. We don't, we all bring stuff into this profession, right? Some of us more than others. And I wanted to give this detailed guide about literally just the whole process for me from how I even heard about it to now me in this sentence right here, talking about the future in a couple of years. So helping others is the fourth and equally important 
as the third answer to this question of why am I even doing this in the first place? This has been the hardest thing I've ever had to do. It's been the most committed. I've been to something in a very long time. I've been so many hours. I've struggled emotionally, mentally. I've had doubts. I have seen adversity, you know, externally and internally. And I've explored so many options in process of trying to overcome them. It's really forced me to look deep within myself to get better. And that is a process that I am forever thankful for. So if you made it this far, if you actually heard the whole video, uh, thank you for listening to my story. I hope it was very helpful. I hope it was informative. And if it wasn't any of those things, then I hope it was at least entertaining. Maybe you passed a nice car ride. If you had a nice hour or two hour car ride. I actually don't know how long it's going to be uh, when I'm recording this. <laughs> so I'm going to see in post. But that is the big picture. That's why I'm doing everything here. And I'll probably do another one of these videos a few years down the line, perhaps when I'm trading for an income. I may have some more to say, some more to learn on this next phase of scaling up mastering new strategies, and then maybe I'll have a video when I talk about trading for a living and getting to that point. And hopefully by the end of those videos, and this is a decently long timeline, a couple of years out, there will be evidence from zero to full-time laid out there on the internet for people to see and people to reference. So that way they have some idea of the roller coaster that they're about to take on. Thanks for listening, everyone. Again, I hope it was helpful. Hope it was entertaining at the very least. And we'll pick this back up uh, hopefully sooner rather than later.